Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, Tyvis Powell, Jason Lloyd. Plus, da 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 da, you're loving him, Mikey McNuggets. And so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. The ultimate Cleveland sports show starts now. Booyah! <laughs> All right, welcome to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, along with Jason Lloyd and Thomas Powell. I'm Adam the Bull. Today we go old school. We'll put together the Ultimate Guardian slash Indian Center. We're going to talk old school basketball about the Big O. We'll get to that a little bit later. And uh, also the Cavs, current Cavaliers. We'll see how they're doing, which is, is it's shit. They're, they're shit right now. <laughs> We'll get to that after their wow, wait a minute. performance. Hashtag the let them know. Hashtag let them know they suck. <laughs> Donovan Mitchell can't make a shot coming off injury. Darius can't make a shot. God. The Guardians have dropped two in a row after winning three straight. We'll get to that and where they stand halfway through their 10-game road trip to begin the season before coming home on Monday next week. But we'll begin with meaningless coaching rankings so I can yell and scream <laughs> about how Mike thinks Kevin Stefanski is the best coach in the league, even though I love him and shouldn't be in the top ten. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. Jeez. Well, I never said he's the best <laughs> coach in the league. That is a bold exaggeration. But, boy, yes. I uh, appreciate that. Nice to see you guys. Yeah, good to see everybody. As you usually How was say, your trip, by the way? You just how was tore through the open in, like, 90 seconds. Well, Let's we, go! I, well, <laughs> Let's get to it! He fired up about the first How was your trip, thing. Mike? It was, it was nice to go home see my family for a little bit. Uh, but I will say... Yeah. And you didn't mention this as you usually do, Bull. That sometimes the show before the show is the real show. And I gave a joke. Of, I thought you guys would get it when I said the big O. And all, oh, I, and all of you missed I got, that. No, no, no. I was, I was well waiting aware. for everybody to crack up, and it was too, <laughs> it was too obscure a reference. A, you you know guys what? didn't get it. You, you should have gave us seven seconds to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> See? Nobody else gets that that's not in studio with us right now, but... That's true. If I would have followed that up with a seven seconds comment. Is that the, is that the funniest thing? Uh, wait, we have breaking news for the Browns. I'm actually not kidding. Uh, Ian Rappaport, the Browns have signed former Jets core special teamer Justin Hardy. Hey, Cleveland, we back. Hey, my boy Jay Hardy back in Cleveland. Uh, and take this, it, uh, it's from Ian Rappaport. Breaking news. I mean... Is, what do you know about Justin Hardy? Tell the Browns. Special teams demon. That's what he is. First of all, he's from Cleveland. Went to Glenville. Shout out to the Ville. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <coughs> sorry about that, uh, Earl. I know you hate them. Uh, shout out to the Ville. But, yeah, Justin is a demon on the – he's been all pro for special teams. Gunner, obviously, this is one of those uh, Bubba Ventrone moves you needed to replace, you know, uh, Mike Ford. So, you got a guy now who's a really good at special teams. Uh, he gonna give you everything. I mean, yeah. listen, that man, he 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 lost his mother tragically, and he said from that moment on, he's made everything about his mother. He plays hard for his mother. Yeah. He wears the chain with the picture of her on it, and you gonna get the best out of him. Everything he's got, and he's in Cleveland, and he's from Cleveland. Yeah, he's you gonna get everything you got from him. So that's a really good signing by the Cleveland Browns. I, I was gonna make fun of Mike for you know, like there should be a level to breaking news. That's big news. The level. He's all pro. Story. He's an all pro gunner. He's like, like the a Browns could sign a new cleaning lady, and and Mike would go breaking news. <laughs> Flow from uh, the, the progressive, progressive, progressive. Commercial with the new cleaning lady <laughs> at uh, the Browns facility. But then you talk about his mother in yep. Cleveland. I can't make fun now. Well, sounds like a good addition. It's a great addition. Jason, you excited about this? Sure. Dang. <laughs> Anytime you're from Cleveland and you get to play yeah, for Cleveland, it's, a big deal. it's always something. Yeah, it's yeah. Wait, I'm getting word. G. Bush says he's going to have 750 yards on offense. <laughs> <laughs> I just got that from G. Bush. That's breaking news right there. All right, so Justin Hardy, the Browns are not done in free agency. This drips and drabs at this point. Free agency is basically over. Are there any significant names still out there in free agency? Justin Simmons. Another, uh, Justin another great guy. Probably the best guy I've ever met. In, in, in my NFL career. Damn. He was like a real stand-up guy. Just a great dude, man. And he's a dog on the field. Better than Russ? Better than Russ. Better than Johnny Menzel? Better than, way better than you Johnny, ever met Johnny Menzel. I've never met Johnny Menzel, but I can tell you that Justin Simmons is probably better. Probably a nicer him. human being. Yeah. Just to give people a little context <laughs> and a little more background on Justin Hardy, he was a 2022 Pro Bowler on special teams. He's been in the league since 20, uh, 2017. He is from Cleveland, Ohio. 
he has very little actual stats that aren't special teams. And by very little, I mean legitimately very little. He signed a three-year, $5.5 million deal with the Jets back in 2021. Isn't he a receiver? Or a corner? He was a receiver in college. college yeah. Oh. He went to Illinois. As a now, that makes more Correct. sense. But now he's Undrafted a free league. agent. Has bounced around on a few practice squads. But since finding a home in New Orleans in 2017, he was a very productive special teams player with the Saints. Then he signed with the Jets on a multi-year deal. He played in 16 regular season games in 2021. Made 12 combined tackles. He forced a fumble on Gunnar <clears throat> Ozuski, I always pronounce his name wrong. Ozuski. Ozuski, when he was playing against the Pittsburgh Steelers, so he already hates Pittsburgh, so that's a great thing yeah. to add into the locker room. Uh, he had 14 tackles and one forced fumble in 17 regular season games on special teams in 2022. And on October 14th of 2023, he was placed on IR with a hamstring injury. Uh, did not record many stats, right. but well, good for him. Justin Hardy, special teams ace, welcome home. Good for him. It's got to be. Do you know him? Yeah, I, you know what? Yeah. When we when we played the Jets on that Thursday night game, as yeah. I was coming in the stadium, yeah. he was getting off the bus, and I, we stood there and talked for a while. And after Joe Flacco won the game, his yeah. words to Joe was, hey, bring my city a championship. So oh, that's cool. it's important to him. It's got to be very exciting for him. Oh, it's huge for him. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. So we're rooting for him. Mm-hmm. Good for him. Uh, <clears throat> is he about your age? Yeah. All right, well, good for Justin Hardy. Good. Sounds like a smart addition. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, mean you want to make a splash? You want to make a splash be, on special tells. teams? Yeah, that right there is a guy who's going to be passionate about it. Um, he's he probably Bubba Ventrone probably could see himself in him because yeah. he's made his niche in the NFL off of special teams, so he takes it very seriously. Brings leadership, bring attitude, bring that dog. And like I said, he's from Cleveland, so he's going you're going to get everything he's got. The Browns for years have been terrible on special teams. Last year, obviously, their kicking game improved yeah. big time. Their punting game improved big time. Yep. Now they make this addition. They also signed Naheem Hines as a return guy. Mm -hmm. So they're really putting some uh, importance into special teams. We got to find a way to get an edge. You know, like defense has come along. Offense is going to be a challenge this year because it's new. So what is something else that people don't really pay a lot of energy and time and focus to? You know, some some organizations say, hey, go do special teams for 10, 15 minutes. You know, it is what it is. Some people are locked in, like we need to lock in to yeah. what we're doing. So it seems like to me the Cleveland Browns are starting to become that organization that actually locks in. I mean, not at the kicking game is back alive, especially right. on the return side. Well, there's new like, rules. Yeah. You don't know what the exactly going to be. So that, you want to you want to have guys that can make plays, and that seems to be what they they seem to be doing with the Himes and the Hardy signing. All right, Mike. Let's get to this. Uh, one one more thing, and I got to read. Yeah. But Hardy was a special teams captain for the Jets. He was the one that told Joe Flacco to go win a championship for my city when he signed with Cleveland. I was just signed that. I know, I'm just, I'm just giving you guys the last little, last little <laughs> bit of context here. And yeah. I'm curious if the new special teams rules and the kickoff specifically has any impact on how they view using Justin Hardy. Yeah, sure. I, I, it, all these, these new rules to make the kicking game more of a real play has made special teams even more important. It's interesting. <clears throat> how often do you burn a spot on the 53 for just special teams. You have guys who excel at special teams, but they also contribute elsewhere. Yeah. But when you have a guy who is just a special teams guy, I can't think of very many. Am I wrong? Well, you got to be, you have special. to be Matt very Slater special. Yeah. In New England. Matthew Slater, Nate Ebner, go Bucks. Um, guys like that, you know. But there's not I mean, these it's spots, not many. Uh, it's not many. So uh, remember uh, the guy in the Bills back in the day was a Tasker. Tom? It's a, right. it's a dude that I played with in the senior bowl. He plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Miles Killebrew. He's like right. that dude now. Really good on special teams. Well, and if you think about it, the Browns have a really good cornerback room. They can yeah. afford for their fifth corner or whatever to be a guy who's not really going to play hey, you never, until injury starts. Hey, you never course. know. I mean, listen, he, he's up there at age, so maybe it ain't the same, but... You know, he got taught in New Orleans how to play corner. He made a couple of plays. That was preseason. He made sure. a couple of plays in the preseason. Like, it's, 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 he's a work in progress when it comes to DB right. because he's been a receiver his entire yeah, life. Yeah. So, I think if, if guys start to get hurt and you're down to your fifth, sixth guy, yeah. like, right. he can get you through a game. Where did he, he go to college? Illinois. Oh, okay, good for him. That's exciting news. All right, Mike, let's keep it moving. Go ahead. Let's get it rolling with the show. Big show today, and as always – our show is sponsored by FanDuel. The sports calendar is loaded, and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. 
That's 200 bucks you can use to bet the tournament, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, and so much more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS and make your first bet a big-time win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And check out this winning parlay we got sent in from Jamie over the weekend. They hit an eight-leg parlay on opening day. Eight money lines. Nice. Hit them all. Turn $10 into $1,135.20. Eight money lines. Yankees, Reds, Twins, Dodgers, Padres, uh, Tigers, Blue Jays, and the Guardians. It all hit. Ten nice. bucks wins one thousand one hundred thirty-five bucks and twenty cents. Congratulations to Jamie. If you have a winning ticket, make sure you send it to us on Twitter via email. We will feature it on the show in the coming days. Very good, Mike. All right. So, at this time of the year, it's the one of the rare slow times in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you see a few free agent signings here and there. The draft is still almost a month away. And so NFL writers have to come up with lists where they're ranking people, whether it's quarterbacks, teams, or, or coaches. And, and one came out recently. Where was this one from? I can't remember. This is from Pro Football Network. Dallas D. Robinson was the writer who ranked the 10 best NFL coaches heading into next season. Andy I mean, Reid at one, Sean McVay two, Kyle Shanahan three, John Harbaugh four, Mike Tomlin five, Jim Harbaugh, the rookie head coach, second time, at six, Matt LaFleur seven, Sean Payton eight, Dan Campbell nine, and Mike McDaniel at ten. By the way, if Dallas Robinson does a list, we got to be on it. Has so I'm be. locked into a Dallas. Anytime Dallas Robinson puts out some content, I'm, I'm locked in. So what's the beef here? Does anybody have a beef that any of those guys are ahead of Kevin? <laughs> we'll put the. They're put all the, more accomplished. Can you just put that back up? Except for uh, Mike, Mike McDaniel. So start at the top. Yeah. Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Super Bowl appearance, Super Bowl, Super Bowl, Super Bowl appearance. Uh, Sean Payton, Super, Super Bowl. Bowl. Dan Campbell, no. I think Campbell's a little high. Like, but what they all have, in, except and Mike McDaniel going off name prior recognition. Yeah. I mean, all, almost all those guys have either been to, at least been to Super Bowl, if not won one. Yeah. Campbell and McDaniel, I think you could put Kevin above them? Matt sure. LaFleur won a super, been to a Super Bowl? No, I said I mean, most. They had, they had Kevin Stefanski 11 and Zach Taylor 12. Now, personally, I do believe Kevin Stefanski is a better coach than Zach Taylor, but yeah. Zach Taylor's gone to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Mike McCarthy's won a Super Bowl, and he's nowhere near the top 10. So, that's not the only criteria he was No, using. but No, but I'm just pointing out what they all have in common there. Uh, Why I think, does Jim get it? He ain't I, been in coaching since. He hasn't even been in the league yeah. in however many years. Because I agree. he's been a great coach. But you don't. Been. I, I it's per, an opinion. I yeah. mean, it's all opinion. I think Sean Payton is vastly overrated. I've said that for years. I mean, <laughs> I think he's wildly overrated as a head coach. The he had Drew, speaks for itself. He no? had Drew Brees with him. As soon as, every, all these guys yes, had great quarterbacks. Okay, but as soon yeah, as Brees left, as soon as Brees retired, he said, I'm out of here. Smart man. Right, but <laughs> the, the reality is he, he like never had a bad year in New Orleans, and Breeze was in the decline those last couple of years. He was there, and they still won. What was his worst season in New Orleans? Like 9-8? and eight? I'll tell you one sec. We'll I mean, see. How do I we'll, put Kevin we'll Stefanski see. ahead of him? We'll see. we'll see what he does in Denver. Now, like, he's got full control. He threw Russ out. Not. The guy we'll won see. a Super Bowl. He's been the deep in the yeah. past a million times. 20 years ago. I mean, Maybe fine. 20 years ago. I, <laughs> fine. If you want to – it's a valid point. He won a Super Bowl. That's yeah. fine. So did but, Mike McCarthy, but, but he, you got Kevin Stefanski over him. I do. <laughs> so what does that have to do with But Mike McDaniel and, and Dan Campbell, I don't think, belong. And, and Matt LaFleur is probably a little bit too high on that I, listen, list. In the end, these lists are stupid. I agree. It's all opinion. I agree. I, is, is, is Kevin Stefanski a top 10 coach? That's pretty he's much a borderline top 10 coach, okay. in my opinion. Yes. So you put him at 11 where he's at. He's about to be paid like a top 10 I, coach. I, so would have, I would have him somewhere between 8 and 12, yes. Right now. Okay. And that's where he is. And that's and it. Yeah, and that's, and that's, the bottom line is once you have a coach that you think is a top 15 coach, whatever, wherever you want to put that line, you stick with them until you can't anymore. That's what I wanted to see. You, you've said for years yeah. there's like three or four really, right. really good ones and three or four really, really bad ones. Right. And the rest, it's just word salad. That's right. So where is he? Is he still in the word salad? I stick. Well, I think there are levels within the word, word salad. I, 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 I. <laughs> I would say there is a tier one. Yeah. And now I think there's a tier two. Yeah. Of good coaches who could become elite coaches. Like 
early in Andy Reid's career, nobody would have called him an elite coach. Right. I think Kevin Steph- – now the question is, right, like – and I used Marvin Lewis last week as the example. The Bengals, when Marvin Lewis came to the Bengals, they had been what the Browns had been before Kevin Stefanski. A complete joke, worst franchise in the league. And Kevin Steph- and, and Marvin Lewis made the Bengals a respectable franchise. He made them a competitive team. Yep. They were pretty good. And, and I thought Marvin Lewis was a, a decent coach, a pretty good coach. Eventually, it got to a point where he couldn't take his, his level of coaching, in my opinion, any higher. They fired him. I thought they waited too long. And now that's where we are with Kevin Stefanski. Kevin Stefanski has proven he's a good coach. Yes. But can he reach that, the, the ultimate level with the top of the, the list? More, time will tell. You have to give him way more time to find that out. If it's five years from now, six years from now, and he still only has one or two playoff wins, I'm going to have to move on. Yeah. But I'm, for now, I say once I know I have a good coach, I keep him around for long enough to prove can he be great or is he just – that's where he is and – you need somebody else to take you the yeah. next I got a question That's about how I this. Look at it. When ahead. you say, you know, you want to see it's going to take some time for yeah. Kevin. If he gives up play calling, does that affect your ability of him as a head coach? It does him? not for me. Okay. Because, because I, all the rest, the top of the names on that all call plays. Let me see that list again. Andy, Sean, Kyle, Le, they, Matt LaFleur. And Mike Tom, Madden, five. Does Tomlin call plays? I don't think he does. No. I didn't say Tomlin. I said oh, okay. Andy, Sean, Kyle, Matt LaFleur, and Mike McDaniels. Five of the ten call Peyton plays. calls plays. Oh, and Sean Payton. Is Jim, Jim going to call plays? Do we know? No. I don't know if he's announced that. He did not call plays. Uh, McDaniel calls plays. Six out of the ten call plays. Okay. I'm trying to call? find out the Jim Harbaugh. I don't Hold on. think he, he's nah, a defensive he's guy. Right. Yeah, I don't yeah, think he's, he's, he's a defensive, defensive guy. guy. Well, but the defense of guys. I guess he could call the defensive plays. But uh, nobody cares no. about that. Whoa, <laughs> it's all offensive, Whoa. right? right. Ro- Robert but, Sala should be calling plays. But here's the thing: <laughs> is that uh, everybody makes such a big deal about the play calling, and I, the only reason I've made a big deal about it in this situation, I've said it time and time again, is I don't want Kevin Stefanski to have his hand forced taking off the play calling. But ultimately, like I, I know Jay said a lot of times, well, what does Alex Van Pelt do? He's not calling the plays. That's not true. The offensive coordinator is, and the defensive coordinator. That's, so, so if we want the head coach not to call plays, then what are they doing? Are they doing nothing all week? Of course they're not. <laughs> they're a big part of the offense. And ultimately, in most cases, the head, you think Mike Tomlin sits there and never, never has any comment on plays? Of course he does. I'm sure there are times when Mike Tomlin says, we're doing this. Yeah. That's and what, he's yeah. the head coach. That's what you better be So doing. the head yeah. coach is always involved, even if he's not calling plays. Um, otherwise... Harbaugh and Tomlin wouldn't get the respect they do. I agree with that. I was just, I just, I was just curious because yeah. the one thing about him has been, like, he's met. The, what I like about Kevin Stefanski yeah. and why I consider him to be maybe a top ten coach is because he is the best when it comes to managing crisis. Yes, if that makes sense. Very good. Like that. Yeah. injuries happen or off the field incidents happen or something like that or locker room stuff happens. You'd be like, oh, they're done. Their minds won't be into the game. And for some odd reason, they come out there on Sunday, they look lights out and they win these games. And I don't think a lot of coaches can have that effect on their players like he can. So I think that that's why I say he's a top 10 coach to me personally, because he has that ability to get everybody to lock in, block out the outside noise, block out the stuff that's going on, focus on the task at hand. Now, as far as the play calling goes, to me, that's just been a, it's been a roller coaster. There's been times where some seasons he's been good, some seasons he's been bad, and it's just a lot of variables that goes into it. But I think this season was the one that showed me, like, this dude can be really good at calling plays. And another thing that I really respect him for, it don't matter who's under center for him, he makes it work for some odd reason. And that's <coughs> something that's special yeah. as well. But he hasn't made it work with Deshaun Watson yet. And that's what he's got. Ah, that TBD, he has it. TBD. I, this, no, to this point. Deshaun yeah. looked, looked good his last few starts. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. He was awful in the first half against Baltimore. And then he dinked and, it dunked to 14 to 14 in the second half. Let's not make it bigger than it was. He won. Okay, well, uh, that's it. We're just going to judge it based on five games. Philip Walker won. Philip win, you know. Walker won. Listen, Kevin Stefanski, I love Kevin Stefanski. I think he's a hell of a coach. I, I think he is in the top ten coaches, right? <coughs> but the, he's got he's to help. And I blame Deshaun Watson a lot for his struggles. But Kevin Stefanski's got to help elevate his game. He's done it like Kevin's great 
with these guys who you don't expect much from, yeah. or when there's no expectation, expectations for the team, Kevin comes through. But what happened when they had expectations the year after Baker? The team went down the tubes. What? There's going to be a ton of expectations this year after the Browns won 12 games last year. They tied the franchise record for most wins. Everybody in Cleveland is expecting the Browns to go to the playoffs, and he can't, you know, how does he deal with the expectations? How does he deal with Watson? It's got to happen for Watson this year. And so that's all on his record. We'll see if he can do it. If, so, so to me, to you, <clears throat> if he gets Deshaun to play well, not even what what, do you, what does Deshaun need to be for you to be like Kevin Stefanski is like a top five. He's like, got to play like a, he's got to play like a star. So that's he got the Browns traded for. So him. he got to play top five. I yeah. wouldn't even. I, I wouldn't even. Top ten. I would take top ten. Okay. I, I take sure. Yeah, I, I don't mean, think so. You don't think if Deshaun played the whole seventeen, he wouldn't have been the top. I don't 10 think we're close. No, he who, wasn't. Who was the Spikey? I'm sorry that I be doing this. Yeah. Who was the? Give me the the tenth quarterback that had like yards wise. Just yards. Yard, That's what we're all right, touchdowns. By? Touchdowns. Give me ten. The, How about PFF grade? I don't want to do that because I right. don't. They're dead to me. All right, give, give well, give the R. Go by Mike. QBR then. QBR. All right, well, I'll give take QBR. Give QBR. Who was tenth QBR. Tenth QBR. Tua was tenth in QBR. Yeah, Tua was having for until the last few weeks an MVP type season. <laughs> yeah, he was not. not he two. was not. Ha- he, Tyreek was having an MVP oh, type come season. On. Here's here's a top ten in QBR just so you guys yeah. know where it goes. Uh, Purdy was first. Prescott second. Allen third. Lamar fourth. Herbert fifth. Stafford six, Cousins seven, Mahomes eight, Jordan Love nine, two a ten, and the next five, just so you understand the next range. Goff eleven, Hertz twelve, Minshew thirteen, Geno fourteen, CJ Stroud fifteen. That's and good where names was, up where was Deshaun with QBR? <laughs> he didn't play a full season. For, based on what he played. Yeah. Uh I get so <laughs> It doesn't go that low. <laughs> well, no, he didn't play enough games to qualify See? in this list. So let me just find. But he still uh, had a QBR. I think it was like 48, wasn't yeah. it? His QBR, they showed a graphic all the time. His QBR was 42.9, which then if you go to the QBR rating, that would have ranked 25th. All right, that sucks. That's terrible. Uh, excuse me, 24th. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, just well, that kid. <laughs> <laughs> Give us the quarterbacks with a lower QBR than Deshaun Watson. Last season, Sam Howell, Aiden O'Connell, Desmond Ritter, Kenny Pickett, Mac Jones, Bryce Young, and Zach Wilson. He's yeah, better than Kenny Pickett. Suck. He's better than Kenny Pickett. Those, those guys all suck. <laughs> None of those guys are starters. Okay, here's the bottom line, Tyvis. I love you, but we got to stop with this. We got to stop with this Deshaun Watson played well nonsense. Oh, every, every, every single person who responded to the Deshaun Watson with his 4-1 and record, those same people were – we're saying not his fault. They went four and twelve against Houston, or when he was with his last year in Houston, he played great. So if if you want credit for four and one to Sean Watson, then he played terrible when when they were four and twelve and he threw for five thousand yards. He gets no credit for those for that good season. None. If you're crediting his four and one, he gets wait, no credit for that minute, season. Wait a minute. You know better. He sucked. He has sucked since he's been here. He had one decent half. He played fine against Tennessee. But any you didn't need him to beat Tennessee. Any slap dick quarterback with the Browns would have beat Tennessee, and you damn well know it. So he's got to play like a superstar because the Browns didn't trade him to be a slap dick there with, with Kenny Pickett and Zach Wilson and, and all these other Howell. scrubs. Don't forget Sam Howell. Sam Howell, all these mutts who are going to be backups. They paid him to be a superstar. Wait. They traded a, a million things for him to be a superstar, and he's been nowhere close. And anybody saying he's been close is conning themselves. So it'll, it better happen this year. That's all I got to say. Tyvis is crying. You're crying. Wait. You said you never cried, Wait. but you're crying. I don't. Wait. Yeah. Can I listen? Yes. Wait, he's Tyvis really is crying. crying. He's, he's crying. crying right now. Zoom in. <laughs> he's crying. He's laughing so much he's crying <laughs> because it's not that serious. Listen. <laughs> What's well, funny? Listen. Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee game. Mm-hmm. He looked good, okay? He stop, did. It, stop it. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Can we not what, he did play and I, is he it play. wait a minute. So is it is it not that he, he played a good he, game against his Tennessee? His shoulder was messed up though. Titus. When he was in Houston. Oh my god. When he was in Houston, did he did you when you saw him play, you said special. What do you have that to, guy's special? He has <laughs> never looked that way here. Never. He had moments. He's had. He's Everybody made. Everybody has moments. He's made some throws. Mark Sanchez had moments. <laughs> Listen, 
Kenny Pickett had moments. The Everybody fact has the, moments. The fact of the matter is this. The same yeah. reason I'm not going to criticize Deshaun is the same reason I didn't criticize Baker his last year. The man played hurt. The man had a messed up shoulder. He did. He wasn't he hurt. Had, he had he, micro tears in his shoulder. Yes, he did. He was, then he, he ended up messing wait, up the whole thing. He was not hurt in 22. Who? Deshaun. What, the six games? Yes. Stop it. He, that was his I first time all, playing in two years. Fault? He doesn't play. That's his fault. He didn't play in two years. That's not my. That's like me that going. Was his choice. That's like me going out he there. He chose not to play. He did practice. He chose not to play for Houston that last year. That was he, his he, choice. He did. Nobody forced him to sit out. That I, is I, true. I think they shelved him over everything that was going on. No, no, no. They shelved him because he refu- He didn't want to play for them. <laughs> I don't remember. I if don't he, remember. he that was well, a long time ago, and 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 <laughs> then he got suspended. He played six games and he wasn't hurt the first few games last year. That was his first time. Yeah. Like, being or having a full off season, knowing to come in and be the starter, and I give you that it yeah. start, but it started off slow and it was progressing, and that's the thing for me. Like it started to progress, and then ever soon as we thought that okay, maybe it's starting to look good, he got hurt with the shoulder. Then we he started to he had the big game against Baltimore in the second half. Boom! Now he's out for the season. So it's like to me, it's still there. I hear it's you. there. I just he just got to do it for I, seventeen. And nobody weeks. Said and I'm not saying he's gonna come out in the first five games and just look top five. I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think it's gonna take him a while. But I think by the end of this upcoming season, he will be playing like a top ten quarterback. I never said that it wasn't still there or that it couldn't be still there. But it has to happen this year. It does. There? I agree with this that. This is it. It's got to happen this year. We can't yes. have any more excuses. I still think he if can he do play, it. If he plays 17 games, I won't say anything. Uh, if he, well, if he plays a full season and he still looks like then, a guy, then, yeah. then that's that. There, there, you know, I agree with that statement. You know, so, and that's why I'm saying Kevin Stefanski has to be part of the team that gets the best out of him. Well, because I, it should be there because we've seen him do it. Here. Well, you, you, I think that they, they're doing that because of the – Changes that they made offensively on the staff. If he can get the best out of Jacoby Brissett and Baker Mayfield and Joe Flacco and Phillip Walker and Deshaun doesn't look his best, you put that on Kevin or do you put that on Deshaun? No, now I would argue that Baker's best season was last year. Yeah, he, yeah, right? he did. But, but, Kev, but he, Kevin <laughs> also got the best got, out of Got him. very good play out of Baker at a younger stage in his career. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, to answer your question, if – Desha- uh, if Deshaun Watson has a bad year again and the Browns are a middling team, I would not fire Kevin's demand. I wouldn't either. So would uh, you – let me say this. Yeah. If, if – say Deshaun doesn't play to the ability. Yeah. Right? And Kevin benches him. Yes. Would you put that as a – would you say that that's more of a top 10 coach move? Or would you be like, he's got to ride it out with Deshaun and make it work? I think that's highly unlikely that they would bench him. For, I know. I'm just saying. But if it happens, would you respect him more? I would respect the move. Okay. Yes. I think it's more likely to happen this year than last year. Last year there was a zero percent chance right. he was ever getting benched. This year it's probably a one percent chance. <laughs> now in or 2025, listen, coach, the 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 Broncos bench Russell. Yeah. So and they it, getting ready to move the on. move the move is if you make the move, ain't nobody gonna really be mad at no. you. If, no, if Deshaun ain't playing well and they all, said they benched him and for who's the backup for Jameis, Jameis yeah. and Jameis is out there lighting it up. Yeah, nobody's going to care if Jameis is lighting it up, but that's only going to happen if Deshaun is really. Yeah, bad. he's got to be really. Yeah, he got to be like no touchdowns, 10 picks yeah, like, like that type of thing. Really awful. Yeah, go ahead. So to Mike. put a bow tie in this conversation to tie back to Stefanski real quick. Does he just simply have to win playoff games? Yes. That's all he has to do to put himself in that conversation for people outside of Cleveland. When yeah, I mean, you the top head coaches in football. You can't solidify yourself as a top ten coach in the league if you've had no success in the playoffs. He's won a game, one game that, that he wasn't there for. But I give him credit for it. Thank you. Yeah. That simple, easy. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right, we're gonna move on. Talk a little stadium here. But first, today's episode of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show is sponsored by Better Health. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in the day? Would you go for a run? Would you take a nap? Would you read a book? Show up for a friend? A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If it was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and help make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do it more often. So if you've been thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, 
flexible and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. By the way, today on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, we are going extra time. Usually we, we take a break. At, we're done at 1 o'clock, and then we come back a couple of minutes later for our people that are paid members, and we do an overtime segment from 8 to 15 minutes. Today, the show is going straight to 120 for everybody who watches the show. And uh, right after 1 o'clock, we'll talk with Mike Farron of MLB Radio about the Guardians and all things baseball. We'll also talk about the Women's Final Four, which is going to be in Cleveland Friday and Sunday uh, later in the show. Right now is the perfect time. If you are have not hit the subscribe button to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, I have no idea what you're doing. We are quickly approaching 40,000 subscribers, right, Mike? <coughs> Correct. And so we're looking to get there before, you know, as soon as possible, and we need your help. So if you're watching the show for the first time or you've been a viewer for uh, many years, if you're not sure, everybody right now go look at YouTube and make sure you're subscribed to the show. We would appreciate a thumbs up, or you could be mad at me for for daring to say that Deshaun Watson hasn't played well and give it a, give me a thumbs down if you want. But we don't like that. Give a, give a thumbs up. You can thumbs up Tyvis if you want. <coughs> that didn't sound appropriate. Uh, anyway, we'll keep it moving for so because uh, Jason's mad about uh, uh, the the stadium situation. Yes, yeah, so we, yes, we talked yesterday. Not no, okay, go ahead. We talked yesterday. We Deshaun on his podcast yeah. said that he wants a dome, and we did have a discussion whether or not players should have any say in this. And then as we were having that discussion, Definitely it was not. announced that a city councilman was holding a press conference at one p.m. to yeah. discuss future of the, the state stadium and the city plans. Yeah. Uh, his name is Brian Casey, a city councilman, and we have the sound for you. This is a snippet from Daryl Ryder uh, from what Brian Casey said, and you can play it. What this basically does, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is ensures that um, the Cleveland Browns uh, have to go through the legal process of leaving the city of Cleveland, whether they want to move the team to Timbuktu or whether they want to move them to Brook Park or to Lakewood or to any other state. Um, they have to uh, go before... Um, the city, Cleveland City Council, ask for permission to leave that team or to move the team, or they have to put the, give us six months' notice and offer to put the team up for sale. We're hoping that the latter does not happen. However, this is going to ensure that, that the Cleveland Browns uh, are going to be a part of the legislative process and the Cleveland City Council is going to have a say-so in that. I think we should have already been involved. I think we should be part of the process. As of right now, those we're not, we're not privileged to anything. These are the Cleveland Browns, and, and I stand by the Cleveland Browns. So for the people of the city of Cleveland, a lot of people who are involved in the negotiations right now um, were either too young or weren't even involved or, or remember when the Browns left the first time. And the heart felt that um, this city went through when that team left. And we want to assure that the, the, the Cleveland Browns remain the Cleveland Browns and that this is a Cleveland team. It's not a, another city team. Um, so that's, that's me where I stand with it. But this, obviously, there's no comparison between this situation and what happened. He's in being 95. a little disingenuous. I'm about to say, I get what he's yeah. saying about the Cleveland. The Browns are moving away. What is Brook Park? 15, 15 minutes. Now listen, I get 15, it. 15 I, I, minutes he away. He is being a little disingenuous. Yeah, However, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. They it, want the team to stay in the city. I, I get that, that too. But yeah. like, dude, it's 15 minutes. Uh, and on top of that, if you ask anybody, if you poll this, I think, and, you, and they build in a dome, I think everybody's going to say, yeah, we'll, t- we'll choose the dome. It, so it, I, I don't, I, I, at the end of the day, it's not like the Cleveland Browns are going to be called the Brook Park Browns. That's not the case. They're going to still be the Cleveland Browns. Everybody's still going to look at them the same. And that right there is ridiculous talk. Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Council hasn't had a seat at the table <clears throat> to this point in, in the negotiations. This has been between Jimmy and City Hall. And I, I, my opinion, watching that, listening to what he had to say, this was his way of trying to crowbar council to the table, to have a seat at the table of negotiations, when really I don't know that it's time <laughs> yet for council to be involved in this. I don't know that it's reached that point yet, but they just want to be involved and informed in what's going on. Okay, fine. The resolution that he's trying to write 
Yeah, the Art Modell rule. It, well, well, no, the, the fact that they're trying to enforce it. Yeah. Do we have it? I sent it to Anthony. Do you have that? Do you want to bring it up? I yeah, guess we can talk about it. Right now. We can pull it. We, so this is the resolution that was passed in 1996. I don't know if you – okay, so you can read it there. I, I'll read it for you. <clears throat> I got this it. Is, no owner of a professional sports team that uses a tax-supported facility, which the Browns do. Yep. For most of its home games and receives financial assistance from the state or a political subdivision, which the Browns do, thereof shall cease playing most of its home games at the facility and begin playing most of its home games elsewhere unless the owner either A, enters into an agreement with the political subdivision permitting the team to play most of its home games elsewhere, B, gives the political subdivision in which the facility is located not less than six months advance notice of the owner's intent to cease playing most of its home games at the facility and during the six months after such notice gives the political subdivision or any individual or group of individuals who reside in the area an opportunity to purchase the team. Okay, so <laughs> the Haslams are well aware of the Modell Law. Right. It's how they got the Columbus crew. That's right. So nothing Brian Casey said yesterday is revelatory in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I, if they, if, I sent, the, I sent the, the language of the Modell Law to a couple people yesterday and said, like, mm -hmm. you know, where are we at with this? And, and people not, aff not affiliated with the Browns, not like legal associated. people. Yeah. yeah. And people who've been involved in stadiums before. And yeah. they said, clearly, the spirit of this law, clearly, is to keep a team within a market. Right. With, within yes. a, within Which a it region. would be, of course. With, of course yeah. it would be. Now, the language, it, it is specific about the municipality. So if they want to take this to court, if city council really wants to fight this and take this to court, they can do that. And they can slug this out in court. And I, my only thing is, like, I hope it doesn't come to that. Like, hopefully there's a better resolution out there because we've seen city council, the mayor, and Brown's owner in a bloodbath before. And nobody wins when no. it gets to that point. If it's better... For all, in, and I understand he's protecting the city of Cleveland's interest as yes. a councilman. I get it, fine. But if it's better for the region to develop this 170 acres by the airport and bring mixed use to it and 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 economic growth and development, isn't that better for the entire area than it is to have a dumpy stadium on the lakefront that prohibits you from doing anything else? Yeah. With the waterfront. And why would you want to hold hostage a team that has a better alternative elsewhere? And it's, I know I'm watering this down, and it's more complicated than yes. that because there's finances involved, and you got to find a way to pay for it. I get all that. But in the grand scheme of things, in the big picture of things, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm very clearly pro-dome in Brook Park. I, for years, said 480 and 77. Go out to 480 and 77 and do this. Well, they picked the Brook Park land. Fine. But I've always been a proponent of this idea. I think this is good for the region. I think this is good for greater Cleveland. It may not be good for the city of Cleveland and, the, and what this guy wants, but in totality, I think this is the better option. I, I would just say that this is way too complicated an issue for me to know what the answer is. Like, it, it, it does the good for the, uh, for, the, for the greater area outweigh the bad for Cleveland? I don't know. I'm not an economist. I can't really speak about that. Uh, is there some grandstanding? Probably. Yes. All politicians grandstand yes. in different circumstances. Is there some, this is going to hurt Cleveland? I mean, I have to believe. I don't know. I, should, I, I actually shouldn't even say that because I just don't know. And I don't think any of us know enough about the economic impact for the region and for the city of Cleveland, both in a positive and negative way. I, do we know for sure? Like, yes. I think most fans would want a stadium in the suburbs that's a dome. I get it. But how much does this hurt the city? I don't know, is it Jason. Is, I, does is, anybody know right now? I think it depends. What are they going to do with the stadium? Like that's. But let's say they turn it into this amazing lakefront area. First of all, it's not that much space that they could do that much with it. And number two, how long is that going to take? I mean, that's not going to happen for years and years. So I don't know. Again... I'm talking about things that I have no business talking about. Yes, selfishly, I think, like most fans do, well, it's going to be great. I want to see this facility. But, the, the, but how much is it going to hurt the city in terms of tax revenue? How much is it going to hurt the businesses in Cleveland? Are, businesses gonna go, are places going to go out of business? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think a business is going to go out 
because a football team moves 15 miles away. I don't, I don't think a bar is going to close because the team's moving 15 miles away. I don't think. Like, I wouldn't think so either. I mean, I they've been, but they, I don't know. So, I mean, it's only what? 10, eight days. Yeah, but the distance, days? I mean, people are not going to, you're not going downtown anymore for home game. No, you're not. So I don't know. Like Jay was speculating. He doesn't know, but, but he the, was speculating that maybe like that these bars might make 20% of their revenue in those 10 home games. But do I, who's to say, yeah, is it an, is it an option that maybe not saying that a lot of fans would do this? Browns go win a big game. Hey, let's go celebrate downtown. Isn't that like a lot of people do that? If you go downtown at 5 p.m. or 6 <laughs> p.m. when there's no game, it's a ghost town. As someone who lives downtown, I can confirm. Yeah, so I don't think people are going to like, well, we're, we just celebrated in Brook Park. They're going to go home. Well, the, and, and I've well, had it depends people. depends on what's yeah. around Brook Park. And too. I've talked to people yeah. who've done these stadiums before yeah. who said, you're going to drive to Brook Park, you're going to go to the game, you're going to get in your car, and you're going to go right. home. Yeah. Now, there, I do think that they're going to build up the area around that because he's that's right. the whole draw of this. Yeah, he so, you, but you're going to go to Jimmy's restaurants and you're going to go to yeah. stay at Jimmy's hotel. So it's going to be great for Jimmy. <laughs> I don't know that. But I also think that development is good for the region. Right now, I, what good is it doing right now? It's 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 blight. It's a closed <laughs> plan. Yeah, that's what I'm right. saying. Like there there's are nothing positives there from tax revenue <laughs> and for the business. But there's nothing no? there. It's just land. It's just like the Cavs facility that they're going to do at the clinic. Right. It's just blight. It's just empty whole, warehouses and parking lots. It's just, it's just run down garbage right now that they're going to try and, and they're going to put a public, a, a, a Cavs practice facility with a public component to it. That's but who, good. But Jason, in, in Brook <laughs> Park, is anybody going to benefit financially besides Jimmy? Do we know that? Brook Park will. Well, okay. <laughs> but Park. it's also, it's, it's good for the region. It's good for everybody to but have more good. options. To have more options and more things to do. I hear you, and, and you're probably right. I just don't know what Jimmy's going to benefit. I, oh well, yes, sure. Sure. Than anybody but I mean, if, if, sure. he, if especially if he's putting two point five, but he's not putting. He's not going to put two point five. He might have no choice. But, well, if he has to foot the bill for the whole thing, I don't think he'll do it. I don't think it'll see? happen. And that's how you wind up back in the crappy stadium on the lake. So then they'll just do the one billion dollar renovation. They'll do the one billion dollar renovation. I, I, I you know, like. I, there's got to be if people I, out there if he that know for how it. devastating this will be for the city. But yet you can also talk to people who say pro sports teams are a drain on cities and the public dollars that it right. takes. I want to know the truth. I demand the truth. I need to know something from somebody. We need to know the reality of the good for people <laughs> and the bad for people in both ways. It's very complicated. Who it do you is. think would give you the most unbiased and just down the middle, straightforward, factual, both sides of the equation. There's probably some economists that have done these studies that are, you know, but then you worry, are they paid by the billionaires to, you know, do whatever they, I don't know. I was trying to say, like, can we get a guest on? I, to I don't know who we can get. I, I just I don't, don't know if that person exists. I don't know. I'll every, give you some names. Every, every, a lot of people are biased one way or the other. It's hard to find somebody that's new. But also biased. one thing that, yeah, hasn't we <laughs> haven't really talked about it at all that yeah. if they do do this, if they do build a dome, the sticker shock that's going to come with the prices to get into that. Oh, God, yeah. It's going to price out a lot of people. Of course. And PSLs are going to come back or some variation of. I was talking to a guy over the weekend who raised the season ticket prices $800 already Jeez. for the lakefront. Yeah. Wait and see what they're going to do to ticket prices Yeah. So in a new stadium. The poor people... Cleveland is mostly poor, a poor community. Uh, those people are going to get... Second highest poverty rate right. in America. So you're going to lose tax Man, revenue. Who? You're going to have less options of restaurants. Then and places Detroit closed. And now the only people that are going to be able to afford to go to games are rich people. Oh, that's no fun. If I, I don't know if the... Here's, I guess, if the alternative is run down Brook Park, yeah. run down Riverfront, Crappy waterfront. Yeah. Is that a better option? How uh, is that a better option? Well, no. If I'm a fan that has – makes a good living, I, I want I think it for I think it sucks to price out yes. common fans. There's no perfect I think option. Sucks. But the, no they're, 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 Oakland, the prices Oracle are going to go Oakland. up anyways because the browns are going to be good. Yeah, but, Tyvis, we're talking we about massive – I mean, I'm just yeah. going off Oracle and – the bay. 
Oh, well, that is. Well, you I don't do. know if it'll be the same. I'm about to say that's, that's a much richer area. I was about to say, country. you you talking about yeah. you went San from, from no. You went from East Bay to yeah. San Francisco waterfront. <laughs> yeah. That's a big difference. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's an it's a, it's a but apt the comparison. prices are going to shoot up. Oh, yeah. And uh, they've already been going up. They went up this. They're going up this year because the team finally had success. What is the what? The, do anybody know what happens with the $1 billion renovations? Like what? Reno, what are they renovated? Do anybody know? If they do, if they go the renovation, route, yeah. I, 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 Nobody even looked that into like that. Total I don't. Waste of money. I don't yeah. think that. That's they, what I'm saying. I don't even think that they have the list yet of. I mean, they'd have to tear this thing down to the bottom and start over, really. And I, I don't know if. I mean, what if Cleveland took over the city of Brook Park? There we go. Problem solved. <laughs> so to put a bow on this, the Art Model Law or whatever, Jason, you say that technically could apply, but you don't think it would ever get. It would it would go to the courts. They would have they, yeah. if they really want to fight this down and road. take this Hopefully to the courts. Doesn't. This could wind up in a court battle. But again, nothing was said yesterday that was a revelation. No, like the Haslam's are well aware of. Right. Uh, they they use that law to get the to get the crew. One thing that I yeah. did learn, we talked about this before. What would happen? I think you mentioned what would happen to the practice facility. Would they take the practice facility? Yes, yeah, so I want to know. To Park? I asked about that. Yeah. No, they they, they are staying in Berea. Oh. Everything with the f- practice facility is staying in Berea. Well, the Brook Park and Berea are pretty close. Yeah, really close, they're right yeah. there. But they, the Browns very much like the uh, partnership that they have with the city of Berea. They've spent a tremendous relationship, and they've got big plans for that land out there. So whatever is at the yeah, practice facility. Yeah, they just bought facility, all that. Yeah, they knocked out a I bunch mean, of houses listen, over there. San Francisco, we practice – we practice right there at the stadium, so it is convenient. Oh, yeah. to it's do that. very convenient. Yeah, but that is not that would not happen here. They would still they'd keep the facility in Berea, and the stadium would be in Brook Park. So there you go. But again, it's so it's close. It's close, than, but it's know. not walk across the street. No, 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 no. Nah, it's you share the same locker room. Yeah, it's I mean this, that would be really nice. Yeah, yeah, one just, locker room, yeah, have all your yeah, stuff yeah. in one spot. It it's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out over the next bunch of years. And and the, and no one seems to be in a hurry on any side of this. And that's the one thing where I keep looking at right. the clock going, you guys got to make decisions. Yes. Yeah, it's it's going to happen sooner than later. And, and I think we touched on this before, but if it's, if this is something that has to go to the ballot, it's a presidential election in the fall. Is that good or bad for the Browns? If they're trying to get something passed because the number, the voter turnout is going to be higher. Yeah. Is that, do they want higher turnout or do you want to try and slide this through like school levies do? And do it in an off year. I don't know the answer to that. Well, the older are they more likely to get more votes from older people? The older, Probably not. The older people should say yes, Probably so they can. Not. Okay, so then you want to do it now because in the look, the year after a presidential election, it's mostly old people that vote. Well, in, in those off I years. think the older people probably would vote against what they would all and I don't even know yeah. like we don't even know what the what the proposal would be Yeah, I need to know what the but I just I think that they could have a hard time getting something passed on the ballot yeah and that's why that's tricky. that's how you wind up back on the lakefront it's not because of this Our press Monday. conference yesterday no. it's not the model no. law it's because you can't get the funding right to do what you want to do in Brook Park that's how you wind up back I'm sure pay, he, pay for it itself I'm sure there were some fans that didn't know about this law before yesterday but obviously the has don't you think I, he'd make the money back 2.5 billion oh he'd make it back he'd make it back so why, not, so why not pay for it because you don't have to well, he better get. He and I'm, get, I'm, and I'm, be right I'm, I'm with front. you guys. I am with like, you guys. I don't. That's the I part am, that's, I that's totally believe he should change the whole so thing himself. So stuck, like you're gonna make that right back if you build Easy. up the area, like you say, like, like I'm sure. Uh, my what's my dude in Dallas? Uh, Jerry. Jerry Jones. I'm sure Jerry that made his money back yeah. ten times from Jerry's world. Like it's ridiculous. No doubt. He All got right, a whole like, city. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk some Guardians in a sec, but a quick reminder and schedule update. Today's Ultimate Cap Show, usually at 5, it's going to go live about 2, 2.15 2. today. As soon as we wrap up here, Jason and myself heading home, setting up, and we are going to go live. It uh, should be a fascinating show, a deep dive into Evan Mobley and what his ceiling could be moving forward. That's coming up about 2, 2.15 2. today. Will you do a deep dive into UCSS. why Darius Garland is the worst shooter in the NBA right now? Wow. That's not true. Let and him we've know. done plenty of deep dives on Darius Garland already on the Ultimate Cavs show. Today's focused yeah. on some stuff with Donovan, some Evan Mobley ceiling talk, and how badly the Cavs missed Dean Wade, which I don't think any of us expected mm. to ever say Dean before Wade. him. But before we talk Cavs on this show, 
Let's talk a little Guardians Bowl. Tristan McKenzie made his season debut last night. Not great is how I would describe it. Velocity down, gave up four earned runs, five runs in a three and a third innings. What did you make of Sticks in his debut? I didn't, I didn't like what I saw at all last night. He did not look good at all. Um, you know, when he didn't <laughs> have surgery yesterday, uh, last year, it was a, que- a big question mark. Yep. And you worried, okay, uh, maybe he's not going to be the same pitcher and maybe he'll end up having the surgery and then you lose him for 25 or for the 24 and 25 season. I don't want to go down that road that, that far. I love Tristan McKenzie. By all accounts, he's one of the most likable players in the game. But uh, that was pretty. Now, in fairness, uh, really outside of Bieber, Nobody nobody's pitched Bieber particularly well. That's true. <laughs> uh, so far, in the starting <laughs> rotation. But I, I thought McKenzie looked pretty awful yesterday. Well, the thing, everybody knows I love Tristan McKenzie. Yeah. The reason that I was okay with them moving off Shane Bieber is because of him. I was like, you know, he is he a quite the ace? No, but he can work his way into it. He's giving me moments where I was like, that dude can develop to be a, yeah. a great ace for us. What I that that right there what he did yesterday? Yeah, I'm concerned. We might need to ex- I'm, we need to extend Shane Bieber if if McKenzie go play like well, this. that didn't happen. I yeah. know, but listen, it, it, <laughs> if we want to have a run at this thing or a shot at this thing, the pitching got to get much better. I mean, Bybee, Allen, Cookie. Oh my God! I actually thought, <laughs> considering my expectations, he was fine. I, he know. settled down in game oh. more. Carrasco. Carrasco like, settled. He settled down. Man, he started off. I started Terrible. off, man, but after that, he settled down. <laughs> like it's correct at this point in his career. I'll take. Right. I'll take that. Right. What do you give him? Three runs. Four. Yeah. I thought it was I thought four. Three. I thought it was three and five I, innings, wasn't it? I thought it was four. Five I thought it was three. Maybe you know what? Yeah, McKenzie gave him. Four. Yeah, That's McKenzie what gave him is. four. The the concerning part with yeah. Tristan. And it's one start. Yeah, yeah, it's sure. His, it's his, and not only like small sample size, it's his first start. Right. But, you know, I remember having the conversation with Zach Meisel when, when Shane's velocity dipped a couple of years ago. Yeah. You noticed it in the first start. You thought, yep. uh-oh. Yeah. And it never, and it never went up. And with yeah, Tristan's some guys, arm, they build up yeah. and can get <laughs> yeah. better as the season goes. And with but. Tristan's elbow, you yeah. have to say, uh-oh. And, and he typically sits around 92, and last night he was barely breaking 90. Yeah. And he can't survive. That's a massive difference. It's a massive difference. Yeah. He can't survive around 90. Like, that has to get better. It's, yeah. He's, he's going to have problems this year if that's where he taps out at. I think it was – I just looked it up. I think it was 90.5. He that's threw not two pitches enough. above 91 miles an hour last night. Yeah, that's not good. That's not I good enough. Seattle's not a slouch team either, so – Yeah, but their lineup's just okay. I mean, outside, True, of, but outside of Julio Rodriguez. I got like to – you know what? I got to see. Who, who is he uh, slotted to pitch against next? Is it the Twins? It'll be Minnesota, twins. yeah. Nah, nah, I respect the Twins. I got to see them against the Twins. I got to see how they – because you got uh, – having a year off – you got to get it back. Yeah, well, right? we're going to give him plenty yeah, of time. Yeah, 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 just right. The first start was a little alarming. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't good. You know, Tanner Bybee was lousy in his first start. Yeah, he was. Uh, and I have zero concern about him. Less concerned about him. About him was he? He's not coming off an injury. Right. Yeah. It was more than the injury. I just think the velocity being that low well, but is, that's is it. a legitimate I, I'm concern. worried that the velocity is low because of the injury. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I guess it's a different time. I got yeah. to see. Give me, like, yeah. three or four more starts. I got to see. And then uh, Logan Allen, he was yeah, he was ass. Yeah. He the he is, to JD Davis. He, he's a fourth, fifth starter yeah. in, yeah, in yeah, yeah, the yeah. majors. That's right. That's what he is. Yeah, they need Bybee and McKenzie to pitch well. When is Gavin, Gavin? When is Gavin, Gavin coming back? back? He threw a bullpen a couple of days ago, I think, Late. within the last couple of days. Yeah, probably three weeks. Uh, yeah, they got to build him up. He'll oh, probably yeah. be back in a couple of weeks. Maybe okay. give him two starts in the minors once he's ready to go. So <laughs> I mean, Shane. How, now, how big is it that they did not trade Shane Bieber? Oh, yeah. Over Ex- the winter. Extend We him. talked about <laughs> that. ain't happening. <laughs> I know, but, but please you know, I, do it. We talked about that over the winter. That I, I, The impression I was getting was that they weren't going to move him because the, they didn't want to be then in a position where you're trying to find a Shane Bieber at the trade deadline Damn and man. you're paying 3x the price for you right. got in the return for him. Right. So it's a good thing it, right now, the way this he's, is starting out. If he's good thing it, to held on to. And he pitches today. And he's, I'm and about he to pitched, say he pitched today. If and he, he was phenomenal. And it I, was the A's. But, it, but this was, yes, it was the A's, and they are the Durham Bulls. But his stuff played, would play against any line. Well, we're going to find out today. Well, his stuff that day was electric. That was it. Listen, we all, the A's are not a major league team. They're, 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 
I mean, they're a disgrace. They can't I play think, the field. I said the other day, I think they're <laughs> worse right. this year than they were last I, year. I heard, uh, I was listening to Hammy, uh, which game was it? It was probably, it was, I think it was the Saturday game against Oakland. <coughs> and he says on the broadcast, he goes, well, the Oakland people think the team's going to be a lot better this year. And I'm thinking, oof. Are they, There's no way they believe Are that. they guaranteed to lose 100 or more games? I'll be stunned beyond belief if they don't lose 100 games. Yeah. Stunned. Jeez. And when I was talking yesterday about my guy Joe Boyle, their fifth starter, and he yeah. got absolutely annihilated <laughs> last night by Boston. If you, if, I wonder if you combine the A's and the Rockies, if they could avoid losing 100 games yeah. with the one team. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. What's their pitching? Both, they the, neither team has any good pitchers. I didn't know the Yankees was undefeated. So are the Tigers. That's a good start. So yeah. the Tigers is undefeated. And the Pirates. Yeah. Anybody else? Or is it just those three teams? Hey, Jason looked like a dang wizard right now. Oh, there's a long way to go. I know they got a long way to but go. I, 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 I keep saying Gavin it. Williams? I do What's like that? the Tigers. You guys mentioned Gavin Williams. Uh, Andre not reported. He threw a bullpen. 15 pitches felt great. Quote, he's close to going out on a rehab assignment. Okay. So, what was his uh, So maybe two weeks. 15 pitches. What was his injury? Elbow, elbow. elbow. On a, during the workout. So yeah. he would probably need three rehab starts if yeah. they want to start that process now. So 15 I days. I think last week, April. Probably. Two weeks. Two weeks. I think two weeks. Three rehab. Well, I mean, three, only do four. Yeah. Pitches. <laughs> he would have to start the rehab assignment like today. <coughs> back in two weeks. So you, it's probably three weeks. Probably. Probably. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, end that, of April. that would be good. If you got him back before the end of April, yeah. that who's, would be a positive. Who's the, la- who's the last Guardian slash Indian to throw a no hitter? Len, Len Barker. Barker. Perfect game, 1981. I've been saying 1982 for two weeks. So the dude last night did something that we ain't did since 81? Yeah, that was Ronel Blanco, for those who didn't – I was watching the end of the game. Of the Astros. This guy's a journeyman 30-year-old. I caught the last out. Yeah. I I I watched the last two innings. the last out. Um, And by the way, he walked the first batter of the game, walked George Springer of the Blue – and the Blue Jays have a good lineup. They have a very good lineup. He walked George Springer. He then retired 26 in a row – then he walked George Springer again. <laughs> and he got the last out. I'd walk George Springer too <laughs> if I was him. He had th- he only threw like strategy. 105 pitches for a no hitter. He know amazing. he know not to pitch to who yeah. not to pitch so, to. So Bull, you were yeah. not here yesterday. Yeah. And we talked about the Guardians opening weekend. Now, if you missed the Ultimate Guardian show, make sure you check it out. It's a great second episode yesterday. But give us your overall thoughts on what we've seen through five games for the Guardians. Now they've got a whole. Cycle through the rotation, for lack of a better word. Yeah. They're three and two. Hit the ball hard yesterday. Got some unlucky uh, bat uh, They got, But they also got lucky when the ball bounced off Julio Rodriguez's glove for a home run for Tyler Freeman. Yeah. It goes both ways. I like yeah. Freeman. I like we'll, Freeman. We'll talk, well, Freeman. We'll talk Freeman one sec. But, Bo, okay. you weren't here yesterday. So, what were your overall he, thoughts? So, the first my five thoughts games right now are that, it, again, it's early, and they haven't yet faced a good pitcher because Hancock's the worst pitcher on the Mariners. And the next two days will be very interesting because you're facing two excellent pitchers the next two days in Seattle. But it's, a, it's, it's exciting and a very positive step that a lot of the young hitters are off to good starts, including Tyler Freeman, mm-hmm. who, who Jason mentioned. Brian Rocchio's off to a good start. It's great to see. Even David Fry, who I'm, I don't know why he's been in the lineup twice, but he, he's come through, so I guess that's why he's been in the lineup. So it's been a very positive start. I'm a little frustrated that Bo Naylor sat two of the first four games. Zach is, you know, telling me he's he'll be playing the majority of the time. He just wanted to Lost the hedges, kind of baby. work him in slowly a little bit. But the fact that they've hit some home runs, I think they got four in five games, which for them is pretty good. Um, and, you know, you got, I think, nine guys with stolen bases at this point. They're a very athletic team, and you've seen some good things for the offense. Uh, and 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 I'm, you know, is that sustainable? I mean, we're one six, uh, one uh, what thirty second of the season at this point, so got a long way to go. And again, you haven't faced any good pitchers yet, so I don't know. But the offense getting off to a positive start is good. If they had started zero and five, and the offense was terrible, we'd be killing them right now. So while I don't want to go crazy, yeah. it is positive that the offense has gotten off to a good start. And uh, I'm not – the only pitcher I'm worried about really is McKenzie. And Before anyone else the, chimes in, I just want everyone to know Bull lied to you. Only eight players have stolen a base, not nine. So oh, sorry. Please be the, better. That's <laughs> right. Josh Naylor tried to steal please a base, be but he got caught. 
So I'm just saying, be better. Anyway, that's how I feel about it right now. I really like Rokio short so far. Yeah, and it's it feels like I, I said a couple years ago it, it was supposed to be Gabby Arias. Like he was supposed no. to be the short. Now it's Rokio. Now it's Rokio. Yeah. Like they tried with Arias. They yeah. tried and they yeah. tried and they tried, and he basically had the second half last year after they moved on from. Uh, Rosario to yeah. give him that spot, and oh, he just man. couldn't grab hold of it. So now they're moving on to Rokio, and and Brian's off to a good start. Like he looks comfortable at the plate. He doesn't look overwhelmed. I really like Tyler Freeman in center. Like this is working. This is great. So far, so good. He's a guy that looks like he can just. He's going to bat 280 every year of his life. Like he's just. He's not going to hit 25 home runs, but he's a solid major league player. Uh, I think the co- the hopeful comp maybe uh, is maybe an Andrew Benatendi type player. I take that. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, if he becomes Andrew, a little Benatendi, bit of speed, a little bit of speed. Hit two eighty. Hit 13, 15 homers. Yeah, yeah. Drive in seventy. Yeah, you take that in center yeah. field. You take yes, that. Yes, yes. Now, if they're going to really be competitive in the long run, they're still going to need to get a bat. Whether that's replacing Loriano and right, whether it's you know, ends up being Kyle Manzardo as the first baseman with Naylor at the age right. or whatever. Uh, Naylor at first base is just... It's not good. It's not good. No. He, and, he's missed a couple balls yeah. now that And even Jose, had. by the way, that line drive went right yeah. off his glove. I don't yeah. know, it was so weird to yeah. see him make that miss. I'm excited to see Manzardo come up in a couple weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think at some point, Esteban Florial is not, doesn't look like he's part of their plan. No. And part of that is because Freeman is doing such a great yeah. job in center. Eventually, yeah. I think you'll see them DFA Florial. And maybe if DeLauder's ready, go get DeLauder. Yeah. Give him a shot in right field. But it, it felt – and I, we, I, we said this during the offseason. Everything went their way two years ago. Everything went against them last year. Yeah. I don't believe – I never felt like it was that far from flipping back. They just needed a couple of answers in a couple of spots. And so far, it's very early, but so far, if Rokio works at short and Freeman works at center, those are the answers that you were looking for, that right. you needed. Especially when Manzardo will be up, and he seemed, at least going into the season, like a, a safer bet than either of those guys. Yes, yes. So, uh, That's a good way to put it. He's a safer right, bet than safe, those guys. It doesn't guys. mean he's going to pan out, but right. it, it, it feels positive right now. Go ahead, Titus. Two things. Yeah. One, I was. Did Stephen Kwan hit a home run? He did. He did. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's very impressive because yeah. uh, he's great at contact, but home run hitter he was not. But we did say at the beginning of this year that he was probably going to take more chances. So it's nice to see that that's paying off. And the second thing, I was watching the game uh, maybe a couple of days ago. Jose batting in the two spot. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I know. I was looking like James worked up about that. Too. I was I like, no wait problem. a minute. He's at the. I thought he was been at the four like this entire career. Why is he at the I two think spot? Against right-handers, he'll probably bat third. Okay. Against lefties, you might see him in the two spot. It's something that votes playing around yeah. with. He talked about it when I was out there. He talked about it during spring training that. Hosey's comfortable with it. He likes the idea. Yeah. I joked with him, will you bat him leadoff? Like the Yankees bat judge leadoff. <laughs> what about batting him leadoff? And he said, we're not going that far. Yeah. Uh, but, but I like it. It's more at bats. And, you know, with right now, Rokio's batting ninth. So you got a guy who's hitting. Yeah. And, you know, after the first time through, well, Rokio may be on base. Same as Quan. So. Well, I said yesterday with Jay, yeah. I kind of like, and again, we're very early on this. Yeah. <coughs> I kind of like Freeman as a, as a two-hitter. I like the barrel control that he's got. I think there's a lot of hit and run possibilities with Quan uh, opening up the right side of the field. Tyler can spray it through the right side. I, he looks like a prototypical number two hitter to me, Tyler yeah. Freeman. And Jimenez can bat up there too. And I think a lot of people wanted Jimenez up there previously because they just didn't have a lot of options that looked like they were an ideal number two hitter. I think Freeman, because I, Hemi's got more power than Freeman does. So I kind of like Freeman in the two spot. And then you sort of get into what little power you have with yeah. Jose and, and some of the other guys, three, four, five. Can I ask five. a question on that real quick? Yeah. If you do go Quan and then Jimenez, one, two. Yeah. Some managers make a bigger deal of this than others. Some don't care at all, but they're both lefties back to back. Do you like staggering lefty righty in that one, two spot or just get your two best hitters? Or obviously Jose's your best <coughs> hitter, but two of your better hitters in that spot. I don't spot. really care, but I don't care. It does make you vulnerable to late inning matchups to a team bringing a lefty out of the bullpen to face your – you know, that part of the lineup. But if it's your best hitters, then yeah, they should be able to hit hitters. lefties. Your best yeah. hitters can hit lefties. And the, the Guardians just a lefty prominent team. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. now but there, got, are, there are managers who do yeah. like to stagger right, left, right, left, right. Yeah. And plus the, the rule of you have to face, what is the rule? The new rule that you have three to batters. face three batters. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I don't do know. You know, when I, when I played that I had that problem, 
I struggled with left hand pitchers. Do you hit lefty? I could not. No, I heck, I wasn't no switch hitter. I hit. I just couldn't. Well, how hit. did I know you're a right handed hitter? <laughs> Probably just because you didn't. Why see would it. you not know that? Why would I know that? He's you, a lefty. You watch me. You watch I, my tape. I am a left. I but I can't even remember. <laughs> you watch my, my tape. I'm a lefty thrower, but a righty hitter. Really? Oh, I thought it was a reverse. No. Nope. That's weird. Oh, did that's you? Weird. Were, did you? Ever, you ain't never try to switch hit. Uh, when I played. Little League, I would occasionally get up left-handed to bunt once or one couple times. I, I and my bunt left-handed. I when I played, for some odd reason, it was something about a left-hand pitcher that just. And it's not like it's not like his stuff was good. It was yeah. like a mental thing. But right. but I, for the cha- we was to get to the championship. It was me versus him. Two outs, got a guy on third. I had to hit him in. If I struck out, we lost. <laughs> Bat on the ball, you know what I do. Bring him in. We to the championship where your boy won the championship in Little League. So Damn. there you go. That's the story. <laughs> the Cucumbus. His name was Silk. That was the pitcher's name. Silk. Silk. He did this wheel, this high kick before he the pitched. Valenzuela kick. Th- threw me Watch off it. every time. I was like, man, this dude crazy. Put his eyes up to the air. Uh, by the way, I, after I complained about Stephen Vogt's opening day lineup, I was like, okay. Let me let him be with the lineups. Let him find his way. It was just hedge, hedgy you didn't like. No, it was other things I didn't also. But but my biggest beef so far with vote is Sunday's game. The Guardians had first and third, nobody out in <coughs> ninth innings. Tie game. The one game they lost to Oakland. First and third, nobody out top of the ninth. Gabriel Arias at the plate and Bo Naylor at third base. And Gabriel Arias tries to bunt. I don't know if it was supposed to be a suicide squeeze, probably more of what's called a safety squeeze. The difference is, on a suicide squeeze, the second the pitcher throws the ball, if you're the runner at third, you've got to go. On a safety squeeze, you wait till the batter puts the ball in play. All right? Now, I just assumed Arias did that on his own, which I thought was extremely stupid. After the game, Stephen Vogt said that was his call. Now... Zach Meisel said to me yesterday, well, maybe it was Arias and he's covering for him. Mm-hmm. I don't know that for sure. If Steven Vogt called for a squeeze in that situation, that is terrible. We talked about it a little bit yesterday. Yeah, that's terrible. I you said, can't be I bumping didn't, in that situation. I didn't love it. I didn't love it. I didn't yeah. love it with Arias at the plate. But also... Oh, but you have Quan on deck. Yeah, I know. But also, like, it's April. You're a new manager. Let's see what these guys can do. It's kind of yeah. how I look at it. They can't bunt. We know these guys you can't should bunt. be able to bunt. <laughs> you should be able to <laughs> bunt. You're a major leader. Jason, the guy can't. Guys can't bunt anymore. Most Trust guys me. can't bunt. We talked huh. about yes. We talked yeah. about yesterday. It used to be the first few minutes of batting practice. Everybody worked on no, bunting. Nobody works on bunting. Wait a minute. What and day? What game was? Because I, I remember watching a Sunday. game where somebody bunted it, but he got on base though. Well, Stephen Kwan. No, I don't think it was Kwan. Well, I don't. I don't remember. But somebody yeah, they've been bunting a lot. But somebody I bunted it. I got and first made and third. It. Nobody out, and I got Kwan on deck who is likely, at the very least, going to put, put the, the ball, ball in play. play and get you the run home. Like, don't mess with that. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't get it. And it, you, you have a guy who's had, I think, one sacrifice bunt in his career, Gabriel Arias. You have a base runner at third who's not an experienced base runner, doesn't have big-time speed. Yeah. I'll blame Bo Naylor like he was in a tricky spot. And Arias, if he's going to bunt, got to get the bunt down. Yeah. Like he, he bunted and missed. Yeah. But oh, no, this, that, if, that wasn't the bun. I said. If folks <laughs> made that call, that, that's terrible. He's got to he's got to learn from that. Mikey. Yeah. Last thoughts on the pitching matchup tonight: Shane Bieber, Luis Castillo, it's, two of the best arms in the yeah, league. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome. That's fun. Uh, Castillo didn't pitch well in his first start, but we know this guy's a clutch performer. Um, Top five pitcher in the American League this year, Luis. Yeah, Castillo. this is the first real test for the Guardians lineup. Yeah. And, I mean, you mentioned Hancock was their worst starter. He yeah. is. Nice and he, prospect. And he still tied him up for the most part. He did. He struck he out pitched really on three well. pitches, which was bizarre. And he got <laughs> – I mean, the whole Laureano <laughs> thing was weird. He got hit – he clearly swung at that pitch. How yes. he said he didn't swing, he clearly went around. And, and it was one of the runs that came around right. to score. The umpires are too rabbit ears sometimes with that. So I mean, I, the guy's on the bench. Let him be. So, we'll, we'll see what they do with Castillo tonight. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun one. I'm, I'm it is. That's a great morning. game, and tomorrow's good too. You got Logan Allen against uh, Kirby. Kirby's really good. Was yeah, a really good Kirby's pitcher. really good. Uh, two, he's been in the big leagues for two years. The guy's been lights out. All right, uh, we'll do more Guardians at one o'clock. Remember, we're going extra time, a two hour and twenty minute full show for all our viewers today. We'll Can talk you with Mike. Hold on, an extra twenty minutes. Can uh, you what? 
I said, can his bladder hold? Oh, I, think yeah. I, I think by the 20 minute mark, I think I will. Be. <laughs> <laughs> Back teeth will be blown. Like Aaron, I'm going to be <laughs> to baseball coming up at 1 o'clock. And we're going to build our ultimate <laughs> Cleveland baseball player hitter. Yeah, what about are we doing that? 155, right lead into Mike Fred. 1255. 1255, so right, it leads yeah. right in. We're going to talk Cavs here in a sec, but a quick reminder that today's show is sponsored by FanDuel. The sports calendar is loaded, and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on the NCAA tournament, Major League Baseball, the National Basketball Association, NHL games, and so much more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS and make your first bet a big-time win. FanDuel, as always, is America's number one sports book. On Sunday, it was an ugly performance from the Cavs. They got beat by 29 by the Denver Nuggets tonight. They're in Utah, continuing their five-game West Coast road trip. Kickoff, or tip-off, excuse me, is set for 9 o'clock Eastern time. And, Steve, you take this graphic full. The Cavs are 11.5-point favorites tonight in Utah. The Jazz have been a disaster, right? They're not good. A couple guys are out. They have no incentive to win. So, Bull, I want to ask you this before we start with the real question. Yeah. Should the Cavs be favored by 11 and a half against anyone on the road right now? <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm not the authority on that, but I would say probably not. Let right? them know. Jason, what do you think? I'm going to let them know that that spread's too high. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I would not favor. I would, I would take the Jazz. By the way, speaking of Jeez. not to, oh, just to cover. Oh, okay. To cover. By the way, speaking of let them know, so I was making – did you see what the Tigers are doing when they hit home runs now? No. no. Pizza thing. They, they've got all these, like, fake pizzas that they're running around the dugout with. It looks idiotic. Is it a sponsor? Is it I a, don't the, – Well, the, Little Caesars is like – Was the own, Well, the guy who owned Illich, the team, yeah. he died, but he, he owned Little Caesars. It's the family, know. yeah. The family still owns it probably. Little Caesars is – I mean, is there worse pizza than Little Caesars? Jeez. I guess we're not getting them as a sponsor. Five dollar hollows. Five dollar. No five dollar pieces. Little Caesars. <laughs> Domino's is better. I mean, all chain pizza sucks, but Domino's <laughs> is better than Little Caesars. Donato. Pizza Hut. I've never had Donato's. Uh, That's a local chain, right? Or is that Donato's? a Donato's? I thought that was a national. I don't know. Well, Bull, let me ask you, or Jason, worse, let me ask you this. Yeah. Oh no, no! Wait. Let me just finish my point real quick before I okay. rambled on about pizza. So I tweeted. I finally found something worse than the Cavs chain, which I had made fun of the Cavs chain last week here. Yeah. But people got a little worked up when I said I didn't like the Cavs chain. The junkyard dog chain? Yeah, it's, it's absurd. It, it should have gone it's away after, after last year. But, I, got, I got a question, <coughs> McNuggets. Yes. Go ahead. I got a question for you. Dart, did you ever think to do the Nuggets challenge when we played the Nuggets? Do you I know? have no interest in eating 130 chicken nuggets during a battle. Is it so? Is time. it is it well, every nugget point every the point nuggets score, score or is it every point the Cavs score? I don't want to eat 101 nuggets or 130 nuggets. I don't want to eat 100 nuggets of anything. Be, I mean, it's Keep over for a while. It's over that. the course of the game, though, so it can't be that bad. Well, why didn't you do it then? I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> I was busy. Well, that was Making Easter. Vacation plan? Was that Easter? I was eating Easter food. It was food. Easter. I don't yeah, know. I was eating Easter It was food. on Easter. Yeah, no. Well, Tyvis, let me ask you this to get back to the game. We know it was an ugly performance on Sunday. Uh, Donovan afterwards said we all got to play better, including myself. Do you expect an inspired performance tonight from Cleveland to right the ship against Utah, or do we just have to adjust our expectations of this team on a night-to-night basis now? I think you, you're going to get an inspired one. I think Darius plays better. Donovan – the Donovan thing is is interesting because I know he's playing through the knee thing and he's still adjusting with the face mask on. So I'm not expecting him to have a big time game. You know, I, the 20 plus points. I don't even think he's going to even hit 20. But I think it's a it's he's him being out on the court. It just does something to the rest of the team, and that influence needs to take over. Like I don't know what Darius was been doing for the past couple of games, Ooh. but he. That man is tripping. Everybody else is playing. <laughs> yeah, he, I, dude, he's like, am I five points in the course of a game? Like, is he hurt or something? I don't, they, the whole team looks hurt, right? Uh, Don- their, best, their best shooter is Evan Mobley. <laughs> uh, Darth Mitchell uh, with the mask there. Is he, when you watched him play, does he look anywhere close to healthy right now? No. 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 So... <clears throat> Why is he back then? Because they can't win with him not right, can they? They won the, the first game. The first game he came back, they, they played, won. Who did they play? The terrible team. Who did they play? 
No, it was a good team, wasn't it? No, they beat Philadelphia. Yeah. Friday Philly's night. terrible without Embiid. They, they beat us. Awful. They had our number. I know, but they've been <laughs> awful without Embiid. Although he's coming back. I'm about to say, he's coming back. Cavs got seven games left, thankfully. What's the well, what's our record? How, how far away from 50 are we? They have 44 five. wins. 45. In the 45? I'll double check. I think so we gotta, probably we got to go five and two. They have 45. Excuse me, Jason's right. They're probably going to finish as Dang. the four seed, right? Dang. Most Dang. likely, or the five. They're half a game up on the Knicks in the four seed, and they are one game ahead of the Magic for the What are the tiebreakers? Do we know? Is it head-to-head is the first tiebreaker for seeding? I actually, that's a good question. Jason, do you know? You never think about that with basketball for whatever reason. What's the tiebreaker? Tie breaker. Is it head to head? I would assume. Yeah, I think so. What if you're tied? How does it's look? head to head? Then it's conference win percentage. Oh, you're taking so. me back to a lifetime. And if ago. it's conference win percentage, the Knicks have five fewer conference losses and the same amount of wins. No, but what's the Cavs Knicks head to head? Didn't the Knicks win the season series? Uh, Did we beat you. the Knicks this year? Once, I think. Did we? I think. I didn't really, Take a look I at the Cavs Knicks on. head to head. We was and the Cavs it's two one. Knicks Knicks won two one. Yeah. And what about right. Cavs Magic, Mike? Uh I'm pretty sure Cavs won. We better. Cavs won. The Cavs Magic is two two. Oh, Ooh. I thought the Cavs won. So that. what's really? the what's the conference winning percentage between those two? Uh a lot of tabs. Hold on. <laughs> uh okay, conference winning percentage between <laughs> the two. Orlando is thirty and seventeen in conference. The Cavs are thirty and twenty. Okay, so we're so losing that. We're probably if yeah, because the Cavs. Are, so most likely the Cavs will the Cavs don't have the tiebreaker against the Knicks, and if they finish tied with Orlando, Orlando's probably going to have the tiebreaker. So we'd be the, the fifth Cavs have three more losses in conference. If they're going to finish tied, it's because the the Magic have played better yeah. the rest of the way. Well, so we'd be playing the Magic no matter what. Well, they could still end up the three seed, and then they wouldn't play. Oh, the, the Magic? No, the Cavs. Cavs. Well, the Magic could end up the three seed also. They're only a. Uh, what did you say? The Cavs are one game ahead of the Magic? So, the, any, those three teams, Cavs, Knicks, Magic, could finish in any order. Yeah. They, want, they can't drop to the six, likely, right? How, how far are they out of the six? Two and a half. They're unlikely to fall yeah, back. unlikely. Far. Possible, but unlikely. Who's that, Indiana? Indiana's a game ahead of Miami for the six. Oh, Philly's dropped to eight, huh? Philly's, <laughs> Philly's in the play in one way or another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The Cavs have a winning record against Indiana this year, don't they? Cavs versus We're Indiana. Throwing a lot at you, Mike. You are. The fact that it matters. They play again. So the second last game of the season, uh, Indiana is two and one against the Cavs. Okay. With a fourth game coming on April twelfth. <laughs> so if they, <laughs> you need so to if, they, this if the Pacers win that game and they finish tied, the Cavs would drop all the way to the six potentially. Will you stop? Why are you? Wanna, Unlike they're not going to drop. The Cavs are going to. I don't. Go. Do you trust the Cavs to win any games right now? Tonight. Utah's a tough place to play. It is. They, Donovan's going to be inspired. Traditionally, they, that's, that's been a place where they struggled. It's another altitude yeah. type thing. Right. It hasn't been. I've seen. I've covered a lot of losses, Cavs losses in that building. I do expect them to win tonight. They should win tonight. But it, I don't know if they're going to cover 11 and a half. But I, I do think they win that game. And, you know, Donovan did come out, I forget, back in December it was a home game where he said, like, we just got to start winning games. Yeah. And they right. did. They went on a tear yeah. after that. And so, you know, you do expect. This is a tough road trip, Jason. It, it, I know. Yeah. We were talking about that yesterday. There's Denver, then Utah, Phoenix. Both LAs. Both LAs and extended yeah, Suns, stay Lakers, in LA. Lakers, Clippers, and then they got the Grizzlies at home. They stink. The Pacers at home, and then the Hornets at home. But they, they should, could easily lose three of the next four here. Yeah. But just when you think, like, everything's unraveling, they, tend, they tend to pull the nose up. Yeah. So, I, I still think they get to 50 wins. They get 50 wins. They go 5-2 and two over this stretch, absolutely. Yeah. That's not totally out of the question. No. Meanwhile, the, it looks like the Lakers are going to make the play in. The issue is this on this and West Coast trip, and issue may not be the right word, but Phoenix is currently the seventh seed. They need that game. Yep. That's a must, not a must win, but a game that Phoenix really game. needs to win. Yeah, they have a chance to get out of the play in. The Lakers are the nine seed. They're a game and a half back from Sacramento. They're a game and a half ahead of Golden State for the 10th and final playing spot. That's right. Clippers don't really have much to play for. The Clipper, well, the Clippers and the, the Mavericks and the Pelicans are all in that 4, 5, 6 range. Yeah, but Depending the Depending on how the next two games, two games off, go, I mean, it just depends on the next two games. That could mean something. Right. It could be a relatively meaningless game. I don't even think the Clippers are particularly gunning for <coughs> court advantage, Jason. You know how irrelevant they are in the Staples right. Center. I'm not sure home court advantage really benefits them or not against Dallas. 
Memphis is a train wreck. Charlotte is a train wreck, but yep. they beat Cleveland two weeks ago, so yep. never know what's going to happen. Indiana, that game's obviously uh, loaded and it's going to mean a lot, so they really only have two games remaining outside of tonight, if you count tonight, three All right. games. All right, guys, I'm going to give you the game. You tell me, win or loss for the Cavs. You ready? Win, Utah, win. Wait, at the Jazz. Win. Jason. Win. Mike. They, they better win tonight. They better win tonight. At the Suns. Loss. It's at the Suns? Yeah. Loss. I think they lose that game. It's at a back, the, back-to-back West Coast. Durant and Booker need it. It's a loss. At the Lakers. They lose to the Lakers, beat the Clippers. Lose to the Lakers, I'm, beat I'm the Clippers. I'm in the same I mode. think they split. They're going to split All the right, LA so you got That means you got them going two and two on the rest of this trip. They beat the Grizzlies? Yes. yes. Three and two. Pacers? Yes. yes. Yes, they win. All right, so then you got them beating the Hornets, I assume, and going five and two. Yeah. If they go five and two, they have a good chance of ending up as the three seed still. Yeah, and the Knicks have one it. extra game. The Knicks have one extra game to play. How far is the, the Bucks up? They got no chance of catching yeah. the Bucks now, or no. They're two and a half behind Milwaukee. Yeah, I mean the Bucks, but the Bucks are playing really well now. What, They're three games in the loss column behind Milwaukee. They're not catching them, and the Bucks probably have the season series, don't they, for the tiebreaker anyway? Uh, the Cavs have played the Bucks really well this year, actually. That's true. I could tell you if you give me one set. Man, Boston has an eleven and a half game lead, <laughs> and they go they go lose it. If the they don't round. make the finals, oh my he's gone. God. They're going to lose in the second well, round. Well, then he's definitely <laughs> gone. Missoula's out if they lose in the second round. They're going to play the Anything short of the NBA Right now, finals, they have to play Philly in the first round. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's well, not good. <laughs> I, would take, I would take Boston even with him, B. They're better. They're the better team. Yeah. yeah Boston's they, best team in the East. Boston should blow through the East. Yep. But who knows? Yep. I, I don't, I, All right, Mike, what do we got? Uh, I got I two so. things. Let me just give one more little tease to what's coming up on Ultimate Cavs tonight. Then I got to tell you where we're going to be on Saturday, and we want you guys to come join oh, us. Oh, yeah. But on right, the Ultimate Cavs show tonight at 2, 2, 15, whenever Jason and I get home, I looked at the last 11 drafts, top this three picks good. in the last 11 drafts, and tried to figure out by year three, and there's still seven games left for Mobley, are you kind of who you are, or does history say you can still make a jump? So we went through 33 top three picks over the last 10, 11 drafts, going back to the Anthony Bennett draft. All right. No, and no, tried no. to figure out, were they immediate stars? Where'd they get to? What can they get to? And are there a bunch of guys who just never panned out? So we're going to see what kind of category of a mobile. Two Spo- things I'd like to know into. about that. Well, spoiler on that, Anthony yeah. Bennett did not become a star. Yeah. <laughs> and I, first of all, Anthony Bennett, you should have ignored him. Well, you well, can't. He the, He's number one pick. But what I want to know from you, Mike, will you have the context of <laughs> the difference between guys who made, let's say there were guys who broke out in year four, but did they, how much did they play the first couple of years? You know what I mean? I think uh, that makes a difference because Evan Mobley has played legitimate minutes since the beginning, since he first came into the league. Most top three picks play yeah, heavy, heavy minutes. Yeah, top three picks typically play. Because no, most of the time That's you're true. on crappy teams. Yeah, the, well, I was thinking Evan like Giannis who broke out, but he wasn't a whoa, top three pick. So. Whoa, and there are, there are ex- uh, exceptions. Yeah, there are guys who weren't. Top- All right, I'll I be interested to, keep this, to hear what you guys how you got, he broke it down there. All the right, what do we got he now? did a really nice job with that. Good, he did you know, a good job does. of that. So this weekend, yeah, Saturday, yes, at noon, yes, myself, you, Bull, Earl the Pearl, and G. Bush will be at the Great Lakes Collectors Convention. Presented by the Greeny Sports Card Company. It goes on all weekend, April 5th through the 7th, at the Independence Field House. Hundreds of tables of ball card bliss, live sports talk, athlete appearances, your favorite sports media personality appearances, including us, and interactive skills areas. So make sure you bring your memorabilia for the ComC Consignment Center. TNT will accept grading submissions, and you can even search dealer inventory ahead of the event with mascot. Great cards, great location, great show. For more info, visit greenysportscards.com. Like I said, myself, Earl, G, and Bo will be doing a panel from noon to one. We'll be there a little before, a little after, hanging out, interacting with you guys. So make sure you guys come out to the Independence Fieldhouse on Saturday, April 6th, and come hang out with us from noon to one. And you mentioned there they'll be doing grading. So what that is, for those who don't know, if you have baseball cards – or any sports cards at home, but especially baseball cards. You bring them, and they will tell you what uh, cards are graded on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best. And if you have a, a card that may potentially be worth money, it's only going to be worth a lot of money if it's graded at a 10. 
And usually you have to send the cards in and you have to pay for it to be evaluated. I don't know if they're doing it for free or you're, whatever. I'm not sure in this situation. But if you have a bunch of baseball cards and you want to get them evaluated to see if they're worth anything, bring them in. We'll see you this Saturday. All right, Mike. So we're going to have Howard Megdahl on in five minutes. He is Locked On's expert women's basketball analyst to talk a little Final Four. Yeah. But before Howard comes on, I want to ask your guys' thoughts. It was a incredible night of women's basketball last night. The Final Four is set. Steve, take this full. The four teams coming to Cleveland for the Final Four. Undefeated, South Carolina. Caitlin Clark in Iowa. You have Paige Beckers in UConn making their 14th trip to the Final Four in the last 15 seasons. They've lost five players to season any injury this season. They have seven girls or women yeah. suited up each game, still made a Final Four. Amazing. And you have NC State who played in a crazy Elite Eight game against Texas where the three-point line on one end of the court was a different <laughs> distance from the basket That's on nuts. the other end of the court. An absolute travesty. But this is your Final Four heading to Cleveland. Yeah. The event started this morning. The games are on Friday night, the championship on Sunday afternoon. It's not the perfect, ideal four teams you got in there, but you have three mega super teams yeah. in terms of overall interest in South Carolina, Iowa, and UConn. NC State, a little bit of a wild card, but – what were you guys' thoughts? I know you watched the game last well, night. Well, this is the peak of women's basketball. It's never, there's never been a women's sport more popular than women's basketball is right now. Facts. Yes. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to my guys at Bet Rivers where I do my podcast. It was the most uh, money they've ever, most bets and money they've did ever taken. Did you get a number on that? Game. I was actually curious about I, that. I, they did, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. They said that the last night's women's game actually beat a handful of NFL games this year. Wow. In, the, in terms the, of betting. LSU. Not Iowa. a lot, but I a handful. LSU. Yeah, the, LS, the, the LSU game. Now, it's unfortunate. Like, if we, I think we would all love that LSU Iowa to be the championship. Oh, game. yeah. But as, as uh, Mike mentioned, South Carolina's uh, undefeated. But and, I actually think it was smart to put them in the same bracket. I know a lot of people are upset and want yeah. it later on. But you don't, you're not assured of a meeting if you do it later on That's at true. least you you were almost right you i guess you you're never guaranteed of anything in no ncaa tournament but you had better odds of at least getting that rematch by putting yeah. them in the same bracket it could have been a final four but how are you sure how are you what if iowa or lsu has to go up against south carolina in a different, in right. a different you, region at least by putting them in the same region you got that rematch that you otherwise yeah. just may and, not have had. And Caitlin Clark and Iowa took control of that game in the third quarter. Yeah, they did. It was, I think, a tie game or a one-point game. It a tie was, game uh, half, 45. I have never been this into women's basketball. I, I don't even care about the men's tournament, honestly. I care way oh, more yeah, about no. this. <laughs> yeah, I'm much more interested in the women's tournament. The Although, if UConn plays Purdue on the men's final, that'd probably be a really good game. But I, even though UConn's been killing everybody, but Purdue's really good. This also, is how still, uh, this is I'm, this is how invested I am. Yeah, I have ADD. Like I, I it's hard for me to like yeah. get through long articles, even though I'm a writer. It's hilarious. Yeah, I read an eighteen thousand word article from Wright Thompson on Caitlin Clark. That, that came was out. incredible, wow. by the way. Did you read I the whole thing? It. I gotta I, read that. I read most of it and saw the hot, incredible story. It was so long. <laughs> I shouldn't say this. <laughs> I, I read it on my drive home from Pittsburgh during the NCAA tournament. Of course you did. And I, <laughs> I still had half the article to go when wow. I got home. Oh, my God. It was a two-hour – but, I mean, you can only read so much when you're oh, driving. You, you were a really good driver. Man. <laughs> but I had Some, to – Some would say really bad like, there, I, I had, to have, car, some, I had <laughs> to have something to do on the drive home. Yeah. What do you expect me to do? Not so I was reading the story. Jason is talented. <laughs> <laughs> reading an article. Why, you got a Tesla? <laughs> Oh, this is good. Oh, this. Oh, this is good. Cruise set. By the way, ninety-eight. Like she takes some of the sh the three. She takes. Uh, it looks like they're from half court. Yeah. 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 She but shoots everything with confidence. I, I don't know that you necessarily want to read all eighteen thousand words. But yeah. Wright Thompson. Yeah. Parts of it were <laughs> a little flabby. I mean, who am I to criticize Wright Thompson? I think parts of it he could have tightened up a little bit. The story was phenomenal, yeah. and it goes through last year, the, the disappointing loss to LSU, yeah. just Caitlin's mentality and how, how her, out, her on court outbursts and the way that they've tried to dial those back in. And you saw the clip of her father telling her to shut up, get her out of the game the other day. Yeah. I thought that was hysterical. Like, it was really a concerted effort by Iowa to keep her emotions in check and to learn to trust her teammates. And then to see this come full circle in the game last night, uh, 
it was just I was I was into it. I I, yeah, I really enjoyed the game last night. I'm not gonna lie to you. When I watched the game, to me personally, Iowa wanted it more. It meant more to Iowa. LSU it looked like to me, we've been there, we've done it already. You know, we got we won a national championship, but I was hungry because they didn't get a chance to win it. They got yeah. there and they, they out hustled them. Yeah, thought. for sure they yeah. did. Yeah. Injuries yeah. aren't an excuse, but it was a shame to see Angel, Angel, Angel Reese go yeah. down. She wasn't the same. Right. She wasn't yeah. the same. And they didn't get him the ball. No, she I had, what, I I hate hate she had sixteen and twenty, and they. I, I, I got no problem with the LSU players. I hate their coach. She rubs me the wrong way. Well, I don't they like wrote her a they wrote a lengthy article about her. She made that so much. Yeah, she came. The story was even that bad. Like another one. I read that story. It wasn't even bad. Like Ken Babb did a nice job. She's gonna do the shut off. There was nothing in. Like she's going on and on about how they crossed the line by reaching out to her strange father, who you wrote about in your book. Yeah. So like, what are we doing here? Yeah, so I, I agree. I, I won't. I, miss I was. Her. I don't like her, but it, it, I like. I got no problem with any of the LSU players, and uh, well, they have some. I mean, that was a lot of talent on that court last yeah. year. I wanted. As great as that game was, I was yeah. I, I watched a lot of the next game, uh, UConn yeah. versus USC, because I'm a huge Juju fan, and I wanted to see Juju versus Caitlin Clark because Juju shattered all the freshman records. But Paige Buckets, <coughs> man, like she she had a game last night where yeah. she just completely took over. I mean, she was hitting Trey, she was getting to the cup, hitting fast break layups and stuff like that, and Juju just kept going to the cup trying to get. Foul yeah. calls and they weren't calling them for, so they should have adjusted that. But I think it's a overall, it's a great matchup to see UConn yeah. versus Iowa. I do think that UConn is a better team than USC would have been. Yeah. You know, we would have been obviously everybody would have loved to see Juju versus Caitlin, but I think team wise, UConn is a better team that's suited to go up against yeah. Iowa. Uh, South Carolina versus NC State, you know, that's a that's a good matchup. South Carolina, as dominant as they've been, they play some close games as well. Yeah. So NC State could potentially do something there. And it's yeah. also nice, I need to point out, that UConn and NC State both have men and women's teams in the Final Four, which I think is the first time that's ever that happened. Two? Yeah, yeah, NC State's got that... that like guy looks like an offensive lineman. Yes. He's going nuts. Yeah. 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 Everybody's going crazy about. It. They're talking about him being in the NFL draft. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that actually. <laughs> I NFL mean, he's execs. Huge. Yeah. That's he wouldn't be the first college basketball player. I might buy the way, it was a lot. Can somebody explain to me why? What's the Zach Eady? No. What What is with the point guard for LSU? What's her name? Haley Van Lith. Why was she defending her? Caitlin? Caitlin? Yeah. Oh, Caitlin? Yeah. Why was she defending Caitlin? What do you mean, why was she defending she her? She was killing her. <laughs> She's not big wait, enough wait, to... Wait, wait, Did wait you see the wait, clip wait, of the one shot <laughs> Caitlin yes. made? And yeah. the point guard went, well, <laughs> what do you want me to do Can about you it? explain that to me? <laughs> wait a minute. Because they switched late, but it was too late. It was too late. Yeah, they switched it. It was a bad everything. coaching division by... That was terrible. Uh, Kim Mulkey, in my opinion, but frankly, no one's been able to guard... Caitlin right, Clark but all season. But well, LSU's Haley got all these no great chance. athletes and these big girls. <laughs> she was killing her. <laughs> By the way, I saw this. And we uh, have our guest real quick, Bo. So let me actually bring in our women's yeah. basketball expert here. Howard Megdahl, Maybe locked Howard on sports. Uh, he's driving back from Albany right now. He was at the game last night okay. between uh, Iowa and LSU. And Howard, appreciate you joining us. And let me tell you something. Jason it's Lloyd, who loves pleasure. to drive 100 miles an hour, that drive from Albany, where are you going? From Albany to where, Howard? I am dropping off the great Talia Goodman, who writes for me at the nexthoops.com at the airport and going down to South Jersey near Philly. I'm actually about to pick up White Castle as we speak. We are just on the go. That's a good job. I was thought, because if you're going west, you know, out towards Buffalo, then yes. you can just do 100 miles an hour on 90 because it's a dead straight shot. I haven't had White Castle in forever. I haven't either. I'm not the, the, White Castle. The, the, and Kumar. This is Talia's first time. I, I, am, I am dedicated to getting her some good White Castle. I think that's really important. Are you going to get like, as important almost as the work itself? Yeah. Are you going to get like 20 sliders? Yeah, we, we went 10. We were being like. <laughs> reasonable about it but okay. I, I, have i done the 20 before yeah i've done the 20 before <laughs> well let, let me ask you the question i was just asking to mike why did they Please. why why did lsu wait so long to switch up on caitlin clark because van lith right van lith Haley van lith Haley van lith that is she correct could not defend her at all i know he's going through yes I, I mean <laughs> yeah so so it's real easy no i'm, I'm getting the burgers but uh, here's, here's the deal <laughs> yeah 
this is a combination of questions, right? Yeah. You say, all right, if Haley Van Lith is the one who was guarding Caitlin, that that frees up Flauge Johnson, who, frankly, Clark herself told me after the game, she believed would be her primary defensive assignment, and that gives Flauge a chance to score. And she did. She scored 23 points on 18 shots. However, the flip side of that was that HVL got burned by her all evening. So the question you have to ask is, all right, if you made that change, would you have been able to get Caitlin less comfortable? And to me, those that's the most important thing. It wasn't so much Caitlin's going to get hers, but she saw that shot go in. She made her first three of the first half. She made her first three of the second half. And so that allowed Caitlin to operate comfortably, to get to the basket as she needed to. That was a big difference. I probably would have split the difference, started Flauge on Caitlin. And if you have to switch to HVL to give her more of an opportunity to cook offensively for LSU, then you do it. I want to ask you about the, the South Carolina <laughs> NC State matchup. Like, tell me a little bit more about NC State. Obviously, we know South Carolina has been this really good basketball team. They're undefeated. But how is it that NC State has been able to get this far in the tournament? Well, listen, in some ways it's overdue. Westmore, 11 years at NC State, has built a powerhouse. Remember, that is not a team that struggled. They were third in the ACC, one of the best conferences in America. They were a four-point loser to Notre Dame in the ACC title game. So this has been a team that has been gelling and getting better as the year goes along. Now, that said, it is an incredibly tall order for them to take on South Carolina, but quite frankly, it was an incredibly tall order for them to even get to the Final Four in the first place. So, Wes, we were talking to him this morning, and he, he basically said this team is more together than any team that he's ever had. There's always been talent for the Wolfpack. Now they have done it at the right time. Howard, the women's games obviously never been more popular than it is right now. How do they, how do they carry this momentum into next year when Caitlin's gone, when Angel Reese may or may not be gone? How do they propel and continue this momentum when, when their biggest faces of the sport are no longer there? Because everything we're doing right now can allow it to continue because there have always been people who would be capable of carrying women's basketball the way it is now if you have programming, if you have ancillary programming, if you have the ability to watch the game on ABC instead of ESPN or ESPN2. All of these ways in which... Caitlin Clark is benefiting from the expanded profile, the literal term March Madness being able to be used by the women's tournament and not just the men's tournament. That's something that only happened two years ago. This could have been Sabrina. This could have been Asia Wilson. This could have been Brianna Stewart, who won most outstanding player at the Final Four four years in a row, along with four national titles. Caitlin Clark has done incredible things, but from this vantage point, I'm not sitting here and saying Caitlin Clark is the only one who could have done this. It is that a media infrastructure has gotten around to making sure that the women's game gets the coverage it should always had. This could have been for Ann Myers Drysdale back in the 1970s. This is the moment. It is not about the faces. The faces are going to keep changing. The moment is what is allowing Caitlin Clark and the women's game to be elevated. I, Howard, you're definitely right, but I do think there are are other factors that are helping. I think one is that the men's game is becoming less popular. I know when I was a, a kid, when I was a teenager and I grew up in New York and I was a big St. John's fan with Chris Mullen and, and Walter Berry and all those guys, I, I never missed the NCAA tournament. And now I, I've watched more of the women's tournament than I have of the men's. I don't really care about the men's tournament at all. But number two is but I think the depth of talent on the women's side has gotten a lot better, it seems to me, in the last few years. On the women's side, you've always had a few teams that were really good. But I think the depth of quality teams has really improved in the last decade. Is that fair to say? I, I think both of your points are spot on. And yeah, you're talking to somebody who induced himself to get the flu just so I could stay home in eighth grade and watch the Big East tournament. So I yeah. know exactly of what you speak uh, growing up with those John Thompson teams, those Luke Karnasaka teams, yep. and those Jim Beheim teams. Now, all of that said, I think you have numerous opportunities in part because, right, the players are staying for four years. The media infrastructure allows us to know them when they are staying four years yep. in a way that, say, Diana Tarazi and Sue Bird 
did not really get the benefit of number one that number two when they moved to the WNBA it suddenly disappeared and Maya Moore uh, the great Maya Moore has talked about the gap between those two things as well but yeah, to your other point and, and this is just as significant the opportunities and this is look we're 50 years into Title IX, 51 years into Title IX. That means a couple of generations, but Title IX did not suddenly flip a switch and all the opportunities were exactly the same. We have seen that ramping up significantly. And the more people who are getting the chance to play all the time, regularly, early on, getting those reps are more skilled players. And the more that you see various programs investing in women's basketball, suddenly you can't roll the ball out and spend a little money and finish third in the SEC because up and down the SEC, you have programs that are investing. And now suddenly it's a challenge. The Big Ten, it is the same thing. And across the board, players want to go build something too. So not everyone is going to be the ninth player on the UConn bench or to play for Pat Summit but play five minutes a game. They want to go and build something like Asia Wilson did at South Carolina or Victoria Vivian did at Mississippi State or, frankly, add into what Caitlin Clark did at Iowa. Yeah. First of all, I want to say <laughs> shout out to whoever's in the passenger seat because they getting right to it. I hear the bad crumbling. So, <laughs> shout, out, shout out to them. Um, my question is about Ju Juju Watkins. <laughs> You know, Juju has had an unbelievable freshman season, and a lot of people are saying that she's going to be better than Caitlin Clark. Do you see that same thing? Better than Caitlin Clark is a very difficult place to reach. And let's not forget, Caitlin Clark was incredible as a freshman with an assist percentage north of 40, already shooting those threes. Very, very talented. What do I think the ceiling is for Juju, though, is unlimited. I mean, let's not forget, this person is 18 years old, scored more points than any freshman has in the NCAA era since 1982, and is very capable of growing. She also is in the right place. She's playing for Lindsay Gottlieb, one of the most talented coaches in America, and Lindsay is going to do not dissimilarly to what Lisa Bluter did at Iowa. She's going to build around Juju. So you find the right players to play in the right system with Juju. The fact of the matter is, though, if Juju could be one and done, if the rules allowed for that, Juju would be in the conversation for the number one overall pick in this draft. I don't. I think ultimately Caitlin would be the number one, but there'd be a lot of teams trying to figure that out. That's how good she is right now. Howard, with with the popularity of these women and the marketability of these women now, is now the right time for expansion in the WNBA? And is that even being talked about? Because there's there's nowhere for these women to go when they leave college. There's very, very few slots in the WNBA. There's 12 teams, 12 on a roster. It's 144 spots here compared to 450 in the NBA. So at what point can they start to grow the WNBA game when they look at all of these women who – People want to follow now, and people want to see where they go, and it just feels like there's they, all these all these women have to go overseas now if they want to continue playing. Why can't why can't expansion be an option? Is it financial reasons with the WNBA, or is now the opportunity to start opening more markets? Well, so let's talk about it, right? There is an expansion team coming in Golden State. The Golden State Warriors are going to also own a WNBA team in 2025, and so there will be additional <laughs> roster spots come next year. Uh, the league was very, very close to also having an expansion team in Portland. I have some reporting over at thenexthoops.com about how close they came to a 14th team. The bottom line is multiple things. Number one, the WNBA is about to go from a place where significant numbers of teams already make money, and that is a myth, and it's used to kind of denigrate the league in ways that are not accurate, into a place where everyone's going to make a lot of money because after the 2025 season, the league is going to have a new media rights deal. We know that the league is currently negotiating, and Kathy Engelbert, to her credit, the commissioner of the WNBA, has talked about the fact that if the NBA is not able to package things in such a way that gives the WNBA media rights deal what it should be, that they're going to go on their own to negotiate that. We are living in a time where NWSL, National Women's Soccer League, 
just signed a $60 million per year rights deal at a time where the NCAA women's tournament was $65 million per year. So you put all that together and you say, well, the WNBA, which signed their deal almost a decade ago, they're getting about $33 million this year for the entire league rights from ESPN. It's just, it's a crazy thing. Changes only in the WNBA team is suddenly going to be hit for profit. The state should likely go up as a result. There will be a new CBA, assuming uh, we lost out over a pro mindset. I think Howard's driving yeah. through some uh, inclement weather here, so yeah, Howard, we appreciate you. Maybe he can text us who he's. Who, we wanted to. I wanted to wrap it up by asking him who he thinks he's gonna is gonna win the women's tournament. If he if you could text him, Mike or whatever, maybe he can give us some picks. Okay, we, we got him back for a second. Uh, Howard, who do you got winning the tournament before we let you go here? Fortunately, the weather may be affecting the Wi-Fi. I do apologize for that, guys. The short story is a lot more money is coming to the WNBA, and I expect expansion teams to follow. Good. The league is committed to adding a 14th by 2026. Nice. And who, who you got winning the tournament, Howard? I, it is a hard question to answer. I could see any of the four doing it. South Carolina has to be considered the favorite. There is less wrong with Dawn Staley's team than anyone else. That is a team as good defensively as they were last year, but now they shoot 40% from three. Mm-hmm. And I think, I, while I would not be surprised again, to see any of the ones win it, I think Dawn Staley in South Carolina is the favorite. And who are they going to beat in the final? You got the Iowa-UConn game. I, I, Iowa has more weapons than UConn. UConn has dealt with so many injuries. Paige Beckers is elite. Aaliyah Edwards is going to be a force in the WNBA. But I think bottom line is Iowa is going to be too tough for them. Howard, great stuff, man. Drive safe. Enjoy your white we'll castle. Do it We'll talk to you next time from land, fellas. I love it. Take care, <laughs> Howard. Thanks, Howard. Good stuff, man. Thanks, it's, it's an exciting time for women's basketball. I'm into it. There's a lot more guys into it. Mm-hmm. It's good. Hopefully the game continues to grow. Good It'll stuff. be good. And this week in Cleveland should be exciting with all the festivities happening right in our own backyard. Is there any Before we get we to would our... have a WNBA team here again at some point? Was they it had not, a WNBA Was it a rocker? Yeah. Was it? Not anytime soon, but yeah. I wouldn't close the door on that. All yeah, right. the rockers. Mm. Go ahead. We're going to get to our last topic in one sec, but a quick reminder that today's episode of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show is sponsored by Better Health. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in a day? Go for a run, take a nap, read a book, show up for a friend. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question, though, is time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and how to make it a priority. Therapy can help find what matters to you so you can do more of it. So you've been thinking about starting therapy. Give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Just visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. Speaking of extra time, Mike, we're going extra time on this show. Usually we end the show at 1 and do an overtime for just our, our, our uh, paid members. But today the show is going all the way to 120 for all our members. We will not go off the air at 1. Mike Ferrin of MLB Radio will join us just after 1 o'clock to talk about the Guardians and all things baseball to help us wrap up the show. And please, if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Help us get the 40. Our two-year anniversary is coming up in about five weeks, and our goal is to hit 40,000 subscribers on by May 9th, the two-year anniversary of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Mike. Great plug, Bull. Uh, I asked you guys last night, and I thought this would be a fun way to lead into Mike Farron, who's maybe the smartest baseball guy I've ever met. No offense, Bull, but this guy is an absolute genius about every team. I asked you guys to create your Ultimate Cleveland Baseball hitter. You could only use a player once, and I gave you guys six different categories. Batting stance, which is really just your favorite batting stance. Contact, power, approach, base running, and the clutch gene. Now, you can use any player that ever played for Cleveland baseball (coughs) Mm -hmm. to create your perfect Cleveland baseball hitter. If you're in the chat listening, please drop your versions of this. We'll read some at the end if we have time. 
But each of you three gave us your combination of the perfect Cleveland hitter. And Tyvis, I want to start with you, my friend. Mm. So we the first thing we did was uh was it stance? I want Albert Bell's stance because I want not just the fact that it's his stance, but I went with him because I want that intimidation. <laughs> yes. All right. Fran Mill Reyes. That, that's, that's my curveball. Oh, <laughs> he couldn't hit a curveball. That's my boy. I'm not leaving Fran Mill off. I, I text Mike this morning. I went back and forth with it. Yeah. And I said, you know what? Fran Mill, when he hit the ball, that because it's not about, you know, hit. We expected everything to hit. We're talking about the power of mm. the hit. When Fran Mill hit that ball, it was out of there. It was gone. He got some Mill Reyes. He got <laughs> He's not even. A, he doesn't even have a job right now. He's no. out of baseball. So what? He got okay. some of the longest home runs in Guardian uh, slash Indian history. All right. So he got like four of them up right. there, actually. I mean, the rest of the list is, you know, probably the same guys that everybody else is going to have. Yeah, probably. Game. But, you know, I, Go ahead. my I, friend Mill one is, I, I'm not leaving friend Mill longer. He was the best all thing right. that happened to the Columbus Clippers for the one or two games that I, he was there. I think everybody might have Kenny Lofton at base right Oh, yeah, yeah, you got to. You I, got I'm to. curious on the Omar Vizquel approach. Yeah. I like I like him. He's a he's a very good player to me. When you think about plate discipline, I thought he batted well. I thought he, you know, when you get there, you need to have the good eyes and all of those things. So I okay. went with Omar Vizquel. What's wrong with that? I'm just, I'm just asking. I'm not because you you questioned it like like. I'm just asking. Why you right. wouldn't have picked him? No, no, I did not pick him. He's nowhere on my list. Dang, he's not on my list. You either. know what? You forget about. Did anybody legends, have Jose man. Ramirez on a list? I, so, I, so, I did. So, I did not. Have so Jose. what I was gonna do is I yeah. was gonna use him for stance. Okay. But I said I'm gonna yeah. go with Albert Bell. Well, all right. Who's next, Mike? <laughs> That's a good lead-in because Jason, yeah. I did use Jose for stance. Okay. And what I really wanted, if, if you ask me, like, whose swing in Indians history do I admire the most? It's Manny Ramirez. Manny had the most beautiful swing I've ever seen of anyone in a Cleveland Indians jersey. But for clutch, I mean, I believe he's still the postseason leader for home runs, I yeah. think. So uh, you, you, it's, there is no more clutch than that. Yeah. He's, when you've hit more home runs in the postseason than anybody in the history of the game, you get my clutch vote. I think we have all this. We have five of the same six guys, but I think we haven't been. Some I told you spots. guys are similar, but I want to hear. Yeah, yeah, Wait, yeah, who, let me, he got somebody different up there. Let me see that. So list. the Roberto reason, Alomar. yeah. Well, Robbie. I mean, <laughs> Robbie's one of the greatest. I got him on my list. He's a yeah. Hall of Fame hitter. Where I had Robbie for for contact. contact yeah. Uh, stance for Jose. I, 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 since I couldn't use Manny for stance, I went with Jose because That's anyone so that funny. small who can hit the ball like he can. How can you not admire that and appreciate that? Plus, I want to get Jose on the list. That's exactly why Tom, I did it. Yeah, but I took him off. Tommy has the longest home run in team history. He hit one 500 and some odd feet into the trees. So how can you not for power? Loft is pretty self-explanatory for base running. And for approach, Albert Bell, nobody studied pitchers more than Albert. Nobody had a better eye at the plate. Nobody knew balls from strikes better than Albert. He kept note cards on player on pitchers. He was well before his time in scouting reports and doing it all himself. He did yeah. all that. So, oh yeah. I would, so that's I why. I, well, I, I mean, want obviously, put, I want to put him as an approach for me yeah. too. Obviously, <laughs> you could put Albert in a bunch yeah. of different spots. On I, I think I just flip flop Tommy and Bell. Oh really? Power and approach. I think. I think. Right. That's so funny. I'm glad I switched. Take my, it, Steve. But look at my swing. <laughs> My stance. Julio Franco. I forgot about Julio. How do you leave out Julio yeah, Franco? Yeah, that's a good one. That's and you know what? Oh, man, now you're bringing it all back. My car grove for stance. The 20-minute rain too. delay. The yeah, human yeah. rain delay. Now, Julio Franco didn't Everybody play for the Indians very long. Same. I think okay. it was like a year well, or two. No, he was here. <laughs> was it that long? Yeah, he was here for well, And then he came back. At like 52, he came, he came back came and back played again. again. Uh, contact, same as you. Roberto, base running, same as you. Lofton, clutch, same as you. Manny, yeah. I just flip-flopped Tommy and Bell with the power and approach. That's fine. They both could go. I mean, Everybody Bell, Tommy, and Manny could go in any of those and, and contact. I, was, I considered um, um, Jose for approach. Yeah. I you considered could, Jose for a few different spots, but ultimately I left him out. You could actually consider Jose for base running because I don't. He, I That's think he's true. one of the smartest Great base runners. Base I thought about it. He's he aggressive. rarely gets caught stealing. Yes, I thought. I about mean, it. obviously Kenny's a slam dunk. Yeah, you could have put Jose in almost all of those categories, uh, but I ultimately left him out. Didn't we have Lynn two Dorn submissions from the That's chat so real quick. Funny. I want to read for you guys. Yeah. Tequila Mockingbird submitted his batting stance. Jim Tomey, contact Stephen Kwan. I Power, Albert Bell, approach, Michael Brantley, mm, base Brantley's running, Kenny Lofton, and clutch, Carlos Baerga. 
I, I actually want a buyer was my favorite player growing up. I oh, loved yeah. Carlos. Buyer. Like Why didn't you I put wore, him on there? Well, I put they, friend meal on there. There were better <laughs> options. I wore number nine. Like yeah. I loved Carlos Bayer. Have you you've I'm sure you've met him plenty oh, yeah. of times, right? Yeah. yeah, he is such a nice guy. Yeah, he is. I he is. played in a charity softball game with him. We were on the same team. It was so fun. He was great. Yeah, yeah, he's he is in a role where he's sort of front facing for the organization now yeah, yeah, and yeah. community relations and that right. sort of thing. Charity softball games. That's yeah. right up his alley. And uh, it's a shame, you yeah. know, they, when they moved on from him, I think they felt like he was too much into the party in life at the time. He said he was in tears. Yeah. He was heartbroken. I think I it kind of blindsided him. But I'm, they moved on at the right time. I'm disappointed in y'all, too. What? Because y'all, y'all picked the, the people that you're supposed to pick. Y'all, y'all I mean, Fran Mill Reyes? That's right. Were you telling me when he hit it, it wasn't go? Uh, Out of there. We have one more submission, and then we can get back to the yeah. Fran Mill situation. Yeah. Uh, Divergent said, Tommy for the swing, Lofton for his speed on the bases, Albert Bell with the clutch gene, Bayerga for contact, and Sandy Alomar for the approach. I mean, by the way, Michael Brantley's a good one that I didn't really think about. I forgot he could about have been Brantley. approach or yes. contact. Yes, he could have been approach for um, sure. 23? You could have others. Lindor in the mix there, too. You could have I thought about Frankie. Yeah, I th- but I want to go with Jose. Yeah, because y- y'all wanted to go with the obvious choice. What about Paul Kia Sorrento? I, like I have a, I have another exercise for us. So we're gonna do this for pitchers another Eddie day. Murray left out, go but CC Sabathia. Let's do it in reverse. Let's create the worst <laughs> oh. all-time oh, Cleveland God. baseball hitter. There's a lot of worst batting stance and chat. This, we're gonna use Can some I just of your put answers. Put Austin here. Hedges. No, I knew you was gonna go there. <laughs> so who is the, They're both the on weirdest? The list. <laughs> uh, worst is objective, but who had the weirdest batting stance? Miles Straw. Jerry, Jerry Willard. Had, I feel like I back in the day, he was a backup stance. catcher in the '80s, and I feel like he had a really awkward, wild stance. I mean, you can put Julio for the worst as well. <laughs> He's best. You can put him. Mike Cargo for the worst. Human I mean, Rainbow. I can't think of. So a couple, couple from the chat, stances. real quick. Coco yeah. Crisp, Jason Kipnis. Ken Keltler. For worst batting stance? Yes. Kip- Coco Crisp did have a weird looking stance. He batting was a little stance. weird. I, I like Kip. Kip- I actually considered Kip this for the best batting stance. Yeah. I, I, Kippy, I don't remember yeah. Ken Keltner. That was before my time. Yeah. All right. So, worst contact hitter you've ever seen play for Austin the Hedges. <laughs> Fran Mill Reyes. <laughs> hey, that might be true. <laughs> Windmill Reyes. <laughs> worst might, contact. I'll say that Hedges for contact <laughs> and Fran Mill for approach. <laughs> Yo, Power is Miles God. Straw. Power is miles. That's why it's by category. Pop. Yeah, so, Actually, the chat, Tommy contact. Hinzo for power. He had less power than Miles Straw. You remember Tommy Hinzo? <laughs> remember Tommy, Tommy Hinzo was a backup infielder in the eighties. Yeah, but baseman. in those days, like Second there were baseman. actually guys who didn't have power. Tommy Hinzo is like smaller than me. Oh man! Go Someone ahead. said in the chat, "Worst swing, uh, Tyvis in softball." Oh, first of all, my swing, my swing actually was critiqued. Actually, it was it was evaluated by Tyvis. I said it. It wasn't the chat. <laughs> oh, I was well, my, to protect my boy. My swing was evaluated by uh, who we have on the show that day. It might have been Carlos. He looked at it and said it was. He said your swing is actually really good. See that? So y'all y'all better yeah, y'all pay homage. Pay. Listen. Wait a minute, Anthony. <laughs> Game on the line. The championship on the line. <laughs> Here we it's go. a runner on third. I'm going up against a lefty named Silk. He do this funky kick thing. Knocked it. Boom. Brought him in, won the game, went on to win the championship. You better pay homage, bro. By the way, if he was <laughs> lefty, he would have gone up with this leg. Whatever. <laughs> go ahead, Mike. Kick. We got to get some super chats in before we welcome Mike <laughs> Barron to the show on this extra long edition of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Mud says Browns now have the 17th richest owner. We always talk about the advantage of Haslam's big cash spending to help us work the cap. Is the advantage disappearing? When did he? Be, <coughs> when was he before he was the 17th? And how do we I know he's the 17th? Know. I'm I, not familiar with that. I, 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 you kind of lost me there. 17th richest owner in the NFL. I think he's higher on that, or in all of sports. I think 17th must be all of sports. There's no way he's just 17th. No, he's higher than that. Yeah. I mean. Dan, Dan, Dan's fortune, his wealth exploded when he uh, took Quick in Public, and Jimmy's fortune just exploded by selling Pilot. Mm. So, but I don't. I, I guess I'm not following the question. I don't know. All right. He also said when Tyvis was crying earlier, it was like T.O. That's my quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> 
Are the Jordan crying emoji? Yeah. Yes. Uh, DB Dog 21 said, I watched the Giannis documentary and saw that the Cavs could have drafted him but took Anthony Bennett instead. I never realized that, and I wanted to throw up when I saw it. See that? That's a, that right there? That man knows something. Just imagine Giannis in a in a wine. Giannis got drafted where? Fifteen. Like fifteen. If the, it, yeah. in hindsight, obviously, it was the right pick. Oh yeah. If they took him first overall, everyone might have been who fired. Went, the who next went? Day. Who went second or third? What draft was that? It was Oladipo went second. The first bunch of picks were all bad, right? Yeah. Oladipo was second. It's a Otto terrible Moore draft. Was I was about to say. I just, feel like I, I just read yesterday that this is supposed to be the this year is supposed to be the worst NBA draft in the history of the league. Yeah, it's bad. really the NBA. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be hard. Pre- Giannis saved that one. Although I think there was a couple like second. There were other late round, or undrafted late guys. That was a were... decent draft that just wasn't star laden outside of Giannis. Oh, yeah. We got oh, Mike Farron, so we get through these last two yeah. super chats, and we will welcome in Mike Farron, the only person I know nobody. who is confirmed to be smarter at baseball than Bull. So we got to get these two in. Clear. That confirmed. Yeah, I'm going to confirm it till everyone else knows it's mm, a fact. Uh, Daryl, our guy Daryl says UCSS in Cleveland will be lit all week and <coughs> weekend. With the NCAA tournament here, go Cavs, go Guardians, UCSS, the best show in town. Love you guys, Daryl, a.k.a. The Voice. We love you too, Daryl. And Dog for Life 89 says, hope the Browns get a dome stadium in Brook Park. The home field advantage in a dome with all our fans barking would be epic. Love the show. Go Browns. And with that, let's welcome in the smartest baseball person on the panel, not Adam the Bull. His name is Mike Farron of MLB Network, mm. MLB Radio Network. What's up, Mike? What's going on, guys? How are you? Good, Mike. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Just uh, glad the uh, season is off and running, and uh, we're ready to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little ornery because the Yankees are 5-0. and oh. I don't like when the Yankees are doing well. Uh, I want the Yankees to lose every game they play, so I'm a little angry about that. But but let's talk about it. I want, I want your opinion on last night. Wait a second. Yeah, Hang on it. a second. Does this, how often does this come up in therapy? Because I really feel like it needs to, that like you're more concerned about the Yankees losing than anything else in your life. Like, <laughs> I think that that's something that you probably need to, like, we need to take a deep breath and push ourselves yes. away from the standings and just be like, it doesn't matter. But Mike, I, you see, you're a normal, well-adjusted human being, so you know it doesn't matter, but I'm not. <laughs> He's a toxic, irascible, angry man. Exactly. And when you grow up in New York and you do not root for New York teams, you get your balls busted quite a bit. And so yeah. for years, when I was young, really young, it was Met fans because you had the 86 Mets, and then eventually Yankee fans, and now Yankee fans are so obnoxious. Even now, mm. that they've only won one World Series in the last 23 years, they're still as obnoxious as ever. They think they should be anointed champs every year, so I hate them, and I hate their. I don't really hate them like hate in a real way, but in a baseball sense, I hate them, and I hate their fans. Is that unfair? All right. Yeah. Yeah, but it's fine. Okay. Now, Tristan McKenzie yesterday. Yeah. You know, Tanner Bybee gets a bad start. We don't care. Who? No big deal. It's gonna. It's one game. <clears throat> but because McKenzie is coming off the injury and he never got the surgery, and his velocity was down yesterday. We were a little concerned. How concerned are you or should we be about Tristan McKenzie right now? Um, I would not be overly concerned. Yeah, I talked to him in spring training. He felt good. I, I think the you know, the bigger thing is gonna be watching, let's say like three or four starts in the year to see where the velocity is. I mean, for the most part, it has a tendency to climb over the course of um, over the season, over the first part of the season. Um, so I'm not really that worried about that. And, you know, like, listen, guys are going to have – some guys aren't going to have good starts right out of the gate, right? So I can see that being the case with McKenzie, who undoubtedly was chomping at the bit to get back out there in big league competition after dealing with all those injuries last year. So – I wouldn't put too much stock in it yet, but if we get to the middle of April and the velocity's still down and he's getting knocked around, then I do think it's fair to start being concerned about it because of his injury history and really, quite frankly, because the Guardians are pretty thin rotation-wise behind the guys that they have out there now, with the exception of you know, Gavin Williams, who, who should be coming back soon, um, that that's where I start to get concerned because the, the, we have lauded the Guardians for their pitching depth for a long time, and right now they're not in a position where they have a lot of, of arms that are close to be able to help. At least it doesn't appear to be on paper. So 
that's kind of where my concern would be overall with them. By the way, to, uh, that reminded me of something funny. So Mike and his co-host, Jim Duquette, the former big league GM, uh, their show's called Power Alley on MLB Radio. If you're a baseball fan, it is the best baseball show out there. There's not a close second. And Jim was on, and I've known Mike for a while. Now, we've never actually met in person, but we've talked for a while. And Jim was on my podcast recently, and I mentioned this to him, and I forgot. And now I just remembered, so I'm glad you brought up your trip. Because in the, in, during spring training, Mike and Jim go to all the different spring training sites. They interview the managers. They do, they do great previews of all the teams. And I remember I was at the gym, believe it or not, walking around the track, and I was listening to the Guardians – uh, it, it, your interview with Stephen Vogt. And when Stephen Vogt started ta- listing the guys in the depth chart of the pitching staff after the starters, I started laughing out loud on the track. And then as soon as the interview ends, essentially you and Jim were then laughing out loud based on well, all... <laughs> yeah, I had said at the outset I wasn't as concerned about the Guardians' pitching depth because they've been so good at developing pitching. Right. And sometimes it's just like, you know, you feel like you've got a good feel for a team and then you, like, see their lineup on opening day and you're like, ooh, that doesn't that doesn't look right. You know what I mean? And so when you start to hear the depth names, you went, wait a second. Like, this is not what we've seen in the past. There's not Gavin Williams or Tanner Bybee ready to take the next step. You know, like the unfortunate injuries that, that Espino has had. Um, that's a real, I mean, the guy's got such a special arm. Like you just love to see him be healthy, but that's a guy that would have been in that next wave and, and that next wave just isn't quite ready yet. And so it feels like they're going to have to count on these guys to give them, you know, 140 plus, maybe 150 plus starts out of their top five guys, which is really difficult to do. It happens. It's not impossible but, you know, Bieber has missed time with injuries. McKenzie has missed time with injuries. Like, they're, they're not guys that have a long track record of posting for 32 starts and 190 innings. And that's, I think, where some of the concern comes. Even though there's, there's plenty of talent on the rotation, like when they have those five guys out there, they should be really good. Mike, I've tried to make the argument this spring that I don't think the AL Central is as bad – is, is its reputation. And in the past, it's, it's been pretty lousy. But I, I, I'm high on the Tigers even before the start. I've been high on the Tigers all offseason. I thought Detroit is for real this year. I even think Kansas City's better improved. They made a couple mm-hmm. ro- rotation additions. I think the lineup's going to be a little bit better. Michael Garcia's already off to a, a, a power start that I think a lot of people didn't see coming. Where do you see the Central Division as a whole, and where do the Guardians slide in on it? It's the weakest division in baseball still. I agree that the bottom of the division is better. I know the White Sox are, what, 0-4 now, yeah. but um, I think they've already shown that their pitching is more competitive and they're going to be a far better defensive team than they were a year ago. I don't know how many runs they're going to score, and especially if Aloy Jimenez is going to be out again, which you know he's got an adductor strain now, which you know, they, they've battled a ton of injuries with him. They're thin, um, but their floor should be higher than what it was last season, and I agree with that with Kansas City. I think Kansas City is a much better team than they were last year, but I don't know that they're a team that would contend in in most spots. Um, Detroit really didn't address their offense this winter, and I think that's a big issue for them. As, as Major League ready as all those starters were, and I'm a big Reese Olsen guy. I was excited to see him pitch well last night. I think he's got a chance to be pretty good. Um, And I think the Twins are a pretty solid team overall, although the injury bug has already bitten them, and they're going to be without Royce Lewis, who is, I think, in a lot of ways, the guy that makes them go from being a team that's going to have a chance to win the Central to being a team that you know, can compete in a postseason series. He just does so many things to help lengthen out that lineup, and he seems to have that, um, you know, rise to the occasion to him as well, kind of in the same manner that Carlos Correa does. So um, I think it's a flawed division, and I think because of that, Cleveland can sit there in the mix. But, you know, there's concerns, I think, in the rotation depth. I think there's concerns in the bullpen depth, this Trevor Steven injury is a pretty significant one yeah. for the Guardians. That yep. guy has been really good. And 
that's a that's not a guy that you really feel like you can afford to lose. Um, so they're going to have to find a way to fill that. And you know the offensive issues are no different than they have been. You know, like their best bet to have being a better offensive team is, you know, one is an Andres Jimenez bounce back, and two, Bo Naylor taking the next step forward. But it still leaves them short in the outfield. I mean, it's one of the most incredible stats in baseball that the last time they had an outfielder hit 20 home runs in a season was Michael Brantley a decade ago. (laughs) You know, like that just like it's incredible, right? It's been 10 years since they've had an outfielder hit 20 home runs. And they don't really have those guys. I mean, Floreal has the power, but I don't know if he's going to make enough consistent contact to do it. And they're you know playing a lot of Tyler Freeman in center, which hey, great for him. Like he won that job, and like I like Will Brennan too. Like I think he can hit a little bit, but there's not enough impact in my mind in their lineup. And so that's kind of where the concerns are: is that this is it was very difficult to win with the lineup that they put out two years ago when they did win the division. It's a lot of the same names. They're going to need some of that power to bounce back from a guy like Jimenez, and then they're going to need to find some other other help internally because it just does not seem like they're going to go outside the organization to add what we really feel like they've needed for a long time, which is a corner-hitting outfielder who can yep. bang. Yep. Mike, you know, you was just talking about the pitching, and obviously, mm-hmm. you know, Shane Bieber, this – Everybody, it's a lot of talks about him being traded either at the deadline or after the season. But obviously his first start, he was lights out. If he continues to yeah. play like that and the pitching and the rotation isn't up to standard or where we used, we're used to it being, do you think that they maybe potentially could extend him even though that's something that they have never done? I think it's like we're past the window of extension because I think if Bieber pitches as well as he, he – as he can, if he stays healthy the full season, if the velocity holds that he's added, which has been a big reason, I think, why he's in this position. I mean, even he brought it up unprovoked in spring training this year that the velocity being better was something that he was excited about. Um, I think he's going to be lined up for a payday that the the Guardians aren't going to commit to a starting pitcher. And so I don't think that that's the, the most likely scenario the most likely scenario and unfortunately it's been wash rinse repeat in a lot of ways with this is Bieber's been the subject of trade discussions for a couple of years the Guardian should have a pretty good idea of where the market sits for him or teams that could be interested if he pitches the peak of performance they probably have an idea of what the best package they can get is and they move him at the deadline and I, there's even that chance that they do that if they're in contention because um, they are like for all of the flaws and there certainly are flaws one thing you can say about this front office is that they have not willingly punted a season and they want to be able to be in a position where the team is competitive year in and year out and i do think that's an admirable quality because i don't think every organization has done that but i'm i'm really curious to see how that plays out because i mean there is a case to be made to just say hey listen if we're in the mix we hold on to Bieber regardless. We'll take the draft pick at the end of the year, and, and it gives us the best chance to win now. But I, I think they're always trying to look two or three years down the road. Like, you're, you're planning for the present and the future constantly in Cleveland, which is a smart way to go about it. It's just with the resources that they have, there's not going to be big extensions for guys. And I don't really view them as being a team that's going to extend a starting pitcher for a market value deal anyway, because I think they see the value and like, you're much much more likely to get that for a position player, you know, like what you had with Jose Ramirez or what you had with Andres Jimenez. than I think you are to get a pitcher unless they do it when they're in their pre-arbitration years. Mike, I'll to go a step further than that. I don't believe the guardians under this ownership will ever extend a starting pitcher again. Quite honestly, they, they tried with Clevenger. He rejected the deal that worked out in the guard Indians at the time in their favor. They tried with Bieber. He rejected. They were putting literally the final dots on the eyes and the crossing of the T's with McKenzie last spring. He was about to sign an extension and then the terror shows up. All that gets tabled. He's never going to see an extension from them again. Gavin Williams is a Boris client. He's not being extended. Tanner Bybee already got an extra year of of service time because he finished second in the year. Mm -hmm. If they don't extend him now, they're not going to extend him. Show me the next starting pitcher that the Cleveland Guardians are going to extend on a pre-arbitration deal. I think they go into this now saying, we have five years with these guys. 
and then we're going to trade him with two years of control left. I, Shane would have been traded last year had he not gotten hurt. I think this is just the approach that they have. We're going to draft these guys. We're going to develop yes. them. We have five years with them, and then we move on and we find the next batch. Yeah, I think it. I think it's a. I think you're right, and I think the reason is is that they don't have the front office is not given the resources to run a payroll that's high enough to take risks on starting pitchers. And pitching is the most risky commodity in baseball, right? It's the most valuable in a lot of ways, right? Because you need to have good pitching in order to win. But there is also the biggest risk for players just, I mean, not even not performing, not being available for the yep. length of a contract. It is Everybody really has difficult Tommy John now, to do it. And they're out a year and a half. Everybody has Tommy John. Yeah. You build that yeah. in, you bake and, that into the into the career. And even if they don't, there's any number of other things. I mean, just by risk of throwing hard, you're at greater risk for injury, whether it's Tommy John or a flexor tendon or shoulder issue or any number of different things. I mean, heck, even like the guys that you mentioned there that they talked about extensions with, you're right, they backed off the McKenzie one because he was hurt, right? Bieber had injuries, right? Like it, it's like a Bieber extension may not look, especially coming off the year he had last year, may not look very good right now. I think it's much safer to extend position players than it is pitchers as much as you, you may love quality pitching at the front of a rotation. But like this goes back years, right? They didn't do it with Sabathia. They traded to Lee, Cliff Lee. Like they, as those guys got close to free agency, they replenished their farm system by moving him. But the other thing that they have done for the most part has been competitive as a result of it. And so the strategy has largely worked, even though – I can only imagine how frustrating it is for Guardians fans because it's like, don't get attached to anybody. Mike, if you, if the Rockies and A's consolidated into one team, would it still be the worst in baseball? (laughs) Oh boy, that's a really good question. I think if you put the two teams together, they might be better than the White Sox. Okay, so they might be 20. They might be 20. Whatever it is. Yeah, something like that. They're not good. Like, they're, yeah. they're really like, and, and for, you know, everybody is going to just mark this right now. Everybody is going to pick on Colorado's pitching this year, and that's not going to be fair to them because their numbers are always going to look lousy because they pitch at Coors Field. Yeah. They actually have a couple of decent pitchers, right? Kyle Freeland's not bad, actually. His numbers are going to look terrible because he pitches at Coors. That is a bad offensive team. I mean, it, they're just not good. And they have played really poor defense to this point. So have the A's. But the, the Rockies, like, I went and saw the Rockies play on Saturday night. And, like, I knew they weren't going to be good. And I walked out of it going, ooh, this yeah. is going to be a tough season. And there's just not, like, like outside of Tovar, their shortstop and, and Nolan Jones, they have very few guaranteed building blocks. Like Brenton Doyle is a great story, right? He went to Shepherd University, you know, the D2 in West Virginia, and he won the gold glove last year. But he has not hit at all at the big league level. And I'm not sure that he will unless he cuts down to strikeout. And it looked like he had for the first three weeks of spring, and then all of a sudden the swing and miss crept back into the game as he started facing more and more big league pitchers later in the game. And I just think that there's... Like, the road back to contention for the Rockies, I think, is actually longer than it is for the A's right now. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That division is. Uh, Mike, last thing, folks f- who don't know, not only is Mike a great major league and minor league baseball expert, he also knows as much about college baseball as anybody <laughs> I know. So the Guardians have the first pick in the draft, Mike. We got about 90 seconds left. I know it's early because the college season is, you know, just in its early stages, but... Where are you leaning towards the first pick of the draft for the Guardians? I would give you two names that are worth considering right now. Charlie Condon, who is at Georgia, who leads the nation in home runs and is hitting over 500. Um, This is a guy who was a redshirt freshman a year ago, didn't take a single at bat the first year he was on campus. He was uh, like a a preferred walk-on. And Condon is having an unbelievable year. Really good athlete, six foot six. Uh, He's played some third base and played it pretty well. Real right-handed power. I would say Condon is near the top of the list. I think twice as many walks as strikeouts. It's more homers than strikeouts, wow. and it's like 18 to 13 right now, something like that. Oh. Um, the other name I would consider is probably the more famous one, and that's Jack Caglione, who's the first baseman at the University of Florida. He's also their Sunday starter, so he's a left-handed pitcher that throws 100 miles an hour and also has 
arguably the biggest raw power in college baseball. He has improved his approach significantly at the plate. The walk totals are still pretty high, but he does not give up any contact. He is a legitimate two-way player. His nickname is Jack Tani. Uh, it's just wow. pretty good. Um, but he is like he is a legit force. Um, those are the two guys that I would put at the top of the list right now. And then you can get into like some of the pitchers, Chase Burns, Wake Forest, Agan Smith at Arkansas. But really, those two bats, I think, are the top two guys right now in this draft. I like it. Both sound very appealing. Mike, you're the best. Thanks for joining us as always. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Enjoy staying up late tonight. We will. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. The great Mike Aaron. Week. He does an <laughs> awesome job. MLB radio. I don't know anybody else that knows the majors, the minors, and college. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's really good. So those are, I've heard, I've actually heard of both of those guys. I don't know. I, I didn't realize I those two and Travis Bazanza. I think oh, I've, I've heard his correct. name mentioned is too. The yes, second yes, baseman yes. outfielder from Oregon. But State, how about the kid from Georgia? He just said has got more home runs than strikeouts. Yeah, eighteen home runs. I know it's college, but Still, I don't. Six six third base. I've I've followed Condon a little bit yeah. once they got the number one pick. I didn't yeah. realize he was a six six. Six six. I don't know how Giant. you stay at third base at six yeah, six. Like corner outfielder might make yeah. sense. We'll see you tomorrow on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show.